Hi. This will be an interesting video to make. How strategy gamers dehumanize others. Dehumanization and manipulation in strategy gaming communities. Oh, chapter one, dehumanization. Uh, I've thought about competition and manipulation in strategy games for a long time. But for me, the moment that I thought I want to work out how to tell other people about this it was in 2021. In 2021, I found out that one of my friends was being abused in a relationship by another friend of mine. Um, this was one of my dearest friends, a person I loved greatly, and I had been excited about her relationship with another strategy gamer that I knew, and then I found out uh, it had not been going well. It had, in fact, been going very badly. And I was shocked, and I was angry. But having spent my life in strategy gaming communities, I unfortunately wasn't very surprised. I was already used to seeing people being manipulative around me, breaking rules, not caring about other people. And this sort of behavior coming from this other person that I knew, or maybe more acquaintances than friends, I don't know. But um, it didn't surprise me that much. I could see how it squared sensibly with everything else that I knew about their character. And since then, I've thought a lot about what circumstances lead strategy gamers to abuse and dehumanize the people around them and how I can raise awareness of it, call it out, what I can tell other people um, to do about it. I personally was in a, an abusive relationship in my early 20s, not with a strategy gamer, um, a different sort of abusive relationship, but I definitely know what it is like to be in an abusive relationship. And I have also been like manipulatively harassed by strategy gamers uh, in my time as a strategy game streamer. And so I'll talk about that a little bit as well, but this is a subject that's extremely, extremely close to home for me and extremely important to me. And I hope that I can do a good job of presenting my thoughts about it in a useful way. So I think that strategy gaming communities have ingredients present for people to be very toxic to other people and very manipulative toward other people. And I want to first examine the three ingredients that I think make this sort of behavior um, endemic to strategy gaming communities. Basically make strategy gaming communities very vulnerable to manipulative people. And number one is that they are attractive communities for people who are master manipulators. Strategy games teach us to utilize resources in service of a stated goal. Um, that's what you need to do to manipulate. While strategy games have rule sets we have to play within, they do not generally ask that we abide by those rule sets, and if we would like to save and reload a few times, we can do that. So we're trained to use the things around us to get what we want. We're also taught to expect rules on behavior to be applied to us externally, rather than us needing to manage our own behavior. And we're taught that finding ways to work around the rules is acceptable. These are the things that strategy games teach us. Strategy games are not by themselves bad, but as a thing in the world, some things which are true about them are these points, and that can lead to them being attractive to people who are extremely manipulative human beings. Number two. Another thing that happens a lot in strategy gaming communities is that they become homes for people with poor socialization skills. And I am not trying to come after you, I do not think it is like bad or appropriate to criticize someone for having poor socialization skills. There are all sorts of reasons that someone might be uncomfortable socializing. And I wouldn't even say that most of them are like bad. Like many of them are sensible and reasonable. I find that strategy gaming communities become uh, trauma sanctuaries sometimes, like people who have had really bad experiences in some sorts of social situations turn to games because games are fair and enjoyable and they can meet people and share an interest with them immediately. That is awesome. That's actually a huge positive thing about strategy games. However, it is still the case that many people in strategy gaming communities are poor in terms of socialization skills. And 
Games, especially online, provide social contact in a way which doesn't actually demand or supply much real human connection. So games are a very comfortable place for people who want some sort of human contact, but don't perhaps feel comfortable or adept at deeper human connection. Um, games are a great place for those people to find themselves. Games provide an immediate touching point for communities of players without requiring the players to discover anything else that they share in common or connect in any deeper way. So not everybody in strategy gaming is like this. A lot of strategy gamers I know are incredibly, incredibly socially adept. Some strategy games um, reward you for that. Um, games like Deception Games, for example, it's really powerful to be able to read people and, well, manipulate people. But <laughs> um, strategy gaming communities are full of people who do struggle a little bit with socialization. And so when those people see bad behavior, they may not immediately understand what it is or know how to call it out or understand the mechanisms via which it's appropriate to engage with it and try to reduce it. All right, number three, dehumanization of others. Uh, it's not great, but strategy games do teach us to dehumanize others. Strategy gamers are often put in situations where they feel justified dehumanizing people around them, which is especially dangerous if they were poor at humanizing those people through a lack of social skills allowing them to connect with others to begin with. Um, perhaps the most strategy gamer of these five major mechanisms I want to talk about uh, is opponents. We see the people around us as opponents, but also just in general, all human beings are regularly encouraged to dehumanize others. This isn't exactly unique to strategy games. The environment within which this dehumanization is um, occurring, though, can make it especially dangerous, I think. Why does it matter if we dehumanize someone? It's normal for most human beings to dehumanize or fail to humanize other humans all the time. It's not good, but it isn't abnormal either. Humans ignore wars and suffering in other parts of the globe, bully and gatekeep people outside their interest group, and so on. This is human behavior, not at all unique to strategy gaming circles. But the best strategy gamers are extremely powerful manipulators, surrounded by people with poor social skills, some of whom mistake competence at a game for value as a person. And so when strategy gamers dehumanize someone, they will often use their powers of manipulation against them and not get called out for it. I want to say, like, the best strategy gamers are extremely powerful manipulators. It sounds very damning, but succeeding at a strategy game is about understanding how to manipulate that game. And that's not in and of itself a bad thing. You could say that a conductor of an orchestra was an extremely powerful manipulator on account of their knowledge and expertise at conducting all of the instruments in that orchestra to make a beautiful piece of music. Uh, you could say that a famous painter was an extremely powerful manipulator on account of their ability to take like a blank canvas and some paint and create an incredible work of art that requires extremely powerful manipulation. So I'm not trying to say that being a manipulator in and of itself has to be a bad thing. It's very much a matter of like, how are you using your agency in the world to affect others? And when we are dehumanizing others and manipulating them in service of our own goals without thought as to what that might do to them or others around them and around us, uh, that is generally going to be pretty bad. So I want to talk about these um, reasons in particular that I find dehumanizing to happen a lot in strategy gaming situations. Uh, and first I want to talk about prejudice and algorithm. So strategy gamers often mistakenly believe that success at a game means that you are smarter or more valuable than another person. This is a thing that I have noticed from experience. It doesn't mean that every strategy gamer um, thinks that. It just means that in a strategy gaming community, you will find people expressing that thought um, with some regularity. It's not unique to strategy gaming communities, um, but it is a thing that is in strategy gaming communities. Um, but because of this, seeing, for example, that the most successful players of a game are white men, strategy gamers might often attribute value to white men and diminish the value of others. Uh, I think that 
this sort of overt racism and sexism is a lot less common in strategy gaming now than it was 20 years ago. But if you look at like dialogue around chess or, or poker, for example, from 10 or 20 or more years ago, it is wild. Some of the stuff that gets says and how sexist it is, it is and how racist it sometimes is as well. Uh, but also for what it's worth, I think that I see sexism in this sort of conversation uh, more often than racism. Uh, but I'm not sure that that's... <laughs> I wonder sometimes is that if that's because strategy games are a racist enough space that, at least in the world I inhabit here in the U.S., um, people who play strategy games are so extremely white that there isn't much reason to comment about people who aren't white. Uh, generally, what I'm saying is that strategy gaming is uh, a community which tends to have certain demographics and can be quite cruel to people who don't match those demographics. Uh, yeah, so, success at a game doesn't equal value or intelligence as a person. Hello? Uh, also, strategy games are historically white and male and are gatekept heavily. See this slide. So white men winning at them is kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy, as players from other identity groups will often stop playing when abused and dehumanized in gaming communities. I think this has been getting a lot better. The slide's kind of a downer. I do think that stuff has been improving markedly even over just the last five years, but this sort of stuff is still present in strategy gaming somewhere, sometimes. And if you and if you go and look for it, um, you will find it. Uh, I feel like it's kind of gone from a place where you would see it everywhere, even on like official tournament broadcasts to being something where, unless you were looking for it, you didn't necessarily see it very much. But if you do go and look for it, there it is. All right. Number two reason why strategy gamers dehumanize others, limerence. Limerence, extremely, very, very, very much not unique to strategy gamers. Uh, limerence is a method of human attachment wherein someone fixates on and idealizes another human as their limerent object. Often someone might describe feeling limerence as having a crush on someone. Um, the thing is, limerence typically dehumanizes its target through fixating on an idealized version of them instead of attaching to them in a humanizing way, and it places winning reciprocated affection from them as a goal. These are typically things limerence does, dehumanizes the other person, you have a goal of winning affection from them. And what do strategy gamers do when they have something that they don't consider human and they have a goal within it? They start manipulating, they start pushing rules, they start breaking boundaries, etc. Given how little support women receive in strategy gaming communities from the beginning, women who become limerent objects of strategy gamers often have little recourse when those gamers stop manipulating and breaking rules to try to win their reciprocated affection. Uh, I gendered this uh, perhaps unnecessarily. This is something that I have spoken to many, many, many women about, and I've heard from many, many women about them struggling with this. I haven't heard about it from as many men, but like abusive relationship practices are not something that are monopolized by one gender, and definitely people who are not women can be victims of this as well. Just a second, I'm going to put my cat in timeout. Be right back. I don't actually know how to pause recording. All right, well, we'll fix it in post. Or we probably won't. Welcome back. My cat is now in timeout. So, all right, next. I think in strategy gaming communities, I see a lot of ego defense and self-idealization. I don't, I don't know if these are exactly the right psychological words to use for the behavior I'm describing, but what I see somewhat often is that strategy gamers will place a lot of personal value on their ability to win at games, which sometimes follows from them having been poor, poor socializers who found success in a claim of strategy gaming communities, for example. 
you say the same thing of streamers to some extent. There are a lot of streamers who place a lot of value on their ability to entertain a large audience because they hit content creation fame at age like 17 or 18 and they just never had time to develop like normal human being social skills and ego. But in such situations, strategy gamers might attach their ego to their continued success of the game and if they feel that their ego starts to get threatened, sometimes you will see them warping their own reality to frame themselves as perfect or best players, which actually ends up dehumanizing themselves. If a strategy gamer thinks that they are really, really, really good at League of Legends or something like that, and that is like kind of their identity for themselves, they're losing a whole huge part of their humanity. It's getting buried under the idea that they are good at League of Legends. And then if they start to realize somebody else might be better at League of Legends than them or something like that, well, that was the human humanity that they chose for themselves. That was their identity. And so their entire identity is being threatened. And they start warping the world to try to defend their identity instead of thinking like, hey, wait a second. I'm just kind of a cool human being. Lots of people like me, and it's really fun to like go outside and stuff. Uh, this is not that big a deal. Um, but yeah, once once a strategy gamer makes it so they themselves are not really like multifaceted human beings, and the only thing that's important is playing their ten thousandth game of League of Legends, uh, it's easier for them to break rules and pass judgments on others, in my opinion. Uh, a common fallacy that you see from strategy gamers like this is that if someone else makes a single mistake, uh, they might believe that they are better than the other person just from seeing that one mistake. Uh, they've mistakenly forgotten that they also make mistakes. Um, they're just focusing in on the one flaw that the other person has so that they can think that they are better than that other person. And if they think that they're better than another the person, then they can start dehumanizing that other person as well. And we just lose a whole lot of humanity to this sort of thought spiral. Another way that strategy gamers dehumanize people is by calling them opponents. If strategy gamers attach their ego to having more success at a game than others, others who are successful at the game end up as threats to their ego. Uh, this sometimes exists mainly within the gameplay itself, uh, where it might lead to players cheating because they think they deserve to win and they don't respect their opponent. You can also exit the gameplay, though, and lead to manipulation away from the game, where strategy gamers might dehumanize or belittle competitors or pass judgment on whether their achievements are valuable or not. I don't think any of this would generally happen if you sat down to play a game with somebody else and your primary thought was, this other person is a human being, I care about their feelings, I want them to be happy, uh, they are, you know, reasonable, conscious. What's the word for like sentient? Sentient living beings like me. And we're here to enjoy a game together. But a lot of the time in strategy gaming communities, if someone's really invested in a game, they sit down across from an opponent and their first thought is how am I going to win? How am I going to beat them? And that doesn't lead successfully to humanizing. Um the opponent uh, as often in my experience. The last way that I see dehumanization happening in strategy gaming communities is about money, which is a little bit weird. Um, it's a very different angle, but money has become heavily tied with strategy gaming due to the nature of online content creation platforms. And in a world where viewers want to watch the best player, it pays to present yourself as the best. So you're being asked to present yourself as a certain thing, no matter who you actually are. However, most content creators and strategy gamers in general are not making very much money from what they do, which means that they may be under financial pressure. Even if you're watching someone and they say that they're the best Magic the Gathering player or whatever, that doesn't mean that they are a financially secure human being. In fact, they probably have very low job security because there's no guarantee that magic will continue to be a game that people play competitively uh, with prize support at tournaments or whatever there's no guarantee that twitch will continue being a platform that they can broadcast magic on to their audience 
There's no guarantee that advertisers will keep wanting to spend money on online content to support them. And they may be spending a lot of their time uh, on a career which doesn't build their resume very well for other options. Uh, and honestly, even while everything's going well, they're probably making significantly less money than they could be as like a computer programmer or a data scientist or something like that. So in these communities, there are a lot of people who are under financial pressure. And when you are under financial pressure, it's hard to hold space in your world to care about others when you're feeling pressure to survive on your own. And that is just a frustratingly sad, but regardless, true thing about the world. So now I want to talk a little bit about this manipulation. Manipulation by strategy gamers frequently expresses itself as improperly or incorrectly framing reality in a way that favors them or suggests that they should get what they want. When a strategy gamer is playing chess against you, the arena for them to manipulate is the chessboard, right? Unless they start cheating and manipulating outside the game, in which case they might start doing things like um, accusing you of cheating, launching lawsuits against you, stuff like that. Uh, not saying that every time someone has ever accused someone else at, of cheating in chess, it's been out of desire to manipulate them. Sometimes it's just they were cheating. But you know that's one of the other ways in which you can interact with someone about chess, which isn't actually on the chess board. And so if an, a manipulator gets to a point where they are manipulating you beyond the game itself, They'll start using the channels which are available to manipulate you within the community outside of the game. Accuse you of cheating, spread rumors about you among other competitors, say that they are not interested in playing a tournament if you are invited, etc., etc., etc. All of these things are things which you could justifiably do. You could justifiably accuse someone of cheating because they were cheating, or you had strong evidence to suggest that. You could justifiably spread rumors against someone else because like you knew that they were abusing your friend or something like that and you wanted to get word out. You could justifiably, um, what was the other one? Withdraw from a tournament if someone was invited, if like you just genuinely didn't like them and didn't want to be in a tournament with them. Like that's, these are all things that are allowed. The channels of manipulation are things which reasonable people could do for reasonable reasons. Uh, that's why manipulators are using them, because they don't want their manipulation to just openly and obviously be manipulation, which everyone can understand. They want their manipulation to look like it might be reasonable behavior by a reasonable person so that it can stick. Um, yes, but when we're talking about outside of games, when we're talking about strategy gamers manipulating like within the strategy gaming community, when we're talking about them manipulating people in romantic relationships and stuff like that, kind of like the, the game board, the arena that that is being played in is reality. And so when manipulation is happening there, you're going to see strategy gamers uh, manipulating reality and using all of the ways that we talk about reality to try to get something that they want or dehumanize the other person or insult the other person, etc., etc., etc. I'm going to play you a clip of a man named Adrian uh, being quite angry at me now. Here we go. Well, because he's always, oh, look, look at me. I'm the best player. I'm the best player. And this just like opens all kind of uh, and then, then he is so so confused if he gets exploited or if um, uh, if people like me personally are attacking him, yeah, and and also calling it out, you know, it could be so much different, yeah, but it's not, yeah, and that's why he has to eat all the shit. And then he's like, oh, everybody is so mean to me, yeah, fucking kunstig, idiot, man. Well, all right, perfect. Thank you, Adrian. <laughs> so. Adrian is known as Life Coach Online, but I am not going to call him Life Coach. Um, what that clip was, he's another Slay the Spire streamer, and he has pulled up a 
Reddit post which I made, uh, which had some like comments on recent results that I had. And I was just talking through the different characters and my strategies for different characters. Here I'm talking about defect and how I've felt comfortable on defect for quite a while and, you know, making some statements about how I play defect. Cool. I mean, that seems reasonable to me. That seems like something I should be allowed to do or whatever. Uh, <laughs> but Adrian doesn't like it. And he has pulled it up on stream and is talking to his audience about how I deserve to be bullied for it and so on and so forth. I want to talk about some things that he does in this clip. So I want to talk about ways that he misrepresents reality because Adrian is being immensely manipulative here. And like I said, the way that strategy gamers are manipulative of other people is largely about misrepresenting reality. Uh, so the clip begins just straight away. Because he's always, oh, look, look at me. I'm the best player. I'm the best player. And he's always like, look at me. I'm the best player. I'm the best player. Um, I have never said that I am the best Slay the Spire player. Uh, but Adrian has said that I have said that I am or think that I am so often on his stream that like I just very, very, very regularly at this point have people express that reality is that that's something that I say about myself. I've made a very deliberate point never to say that and never to place myself above other Slay the Spire players for like basically lengthy reasons, but Slay the Spire is like the sixth strategy gaming community iteration for me. And there have been times in my life where I have said, hey, like, I'm really good at this game. I'm better than that person. Um, as a teenager playing strategy games, that was something that I have said in my life. As a poker player, it was something that I have said in my life. It Poker is a very adversarial game, so that was something that kind of everybody said in poker. Um, and I, I moved heavily away from that. <laughs> This isn't something that I say, and it's not something that I'm saying here, but Adrian is reframing me stating something I have achieved, uh, which ideally would be something a community could celebrate together, as me saying that I'm better than others. And in the text that he's looking at, I even give credit to two other Spire players with whom I've shared achievements. So I don't think a reasonable person would read this and interpret it as me trying to prevent myself as being above other people. The reality here is I have never said I am the best Slay the Spire player, and I do not do so here. Um, all I'm doing is saying I had good results in Slay the Spire over the last month. Here's how I did it. Here's a strategy post on Reddit. Point number two. And this just like opens all kind of... Uh, and then, then he is so, so confused if he gets exploited or if, um, uh, if people like me personally are attacking him. Okay. So here... Again, his framing reality is me reacting a very specific way to what he's doing. I'm confused if I get exploited or if people like him are attacking me. I don't actually know what exploited means for what it's worth. Uh, it's, it's weird to say out loud that you're trying to exploit another human being, I think. Um, but anyway, uh, I've never expressed confusion about why Adrian attacks me. And presenting me as being confused is warping of reality. Uh, I think that it serves a double purpose here of suggesting that I'm not very intelligent and also suggesting that the behavior in question is obviously justified. Um, so basically, that person's too dumb to understand why we're bullying him, which like any reasonable person could understand why we're bullying someone. Um, but yeah, in reality, I comfortably understand that Adrian likes bullying other people. Uh, though I also understand it would be a massive overstep for me to try to tell you exactly why. I don't know him. I can read his mind. Uh, Adrian and I have never met. Uh, we've exchanged DMs on Twitter one and a half times uh, and never collaborated uh, on a stream or anything like that. Never had a conversation together. Uh, he just kind of says stuff like this about me on his stream. All right. Yeah. And, and also calling it out, you know. It could be so much different, yeah, but it's not, yeah. It could be so much different, but it's not. So here, Adrian 
I guess he hasn't literally uh, said that it's my fault that it's it's not different, but I, I I feel like we can safely say that that is the meaning of the sentence that he is speaking. Uh, this is like, victim blaming, yeah. <laughs> um, in reality, I DM'd Adrian privately to ask him if he could res if we could resolve this privately over three years ago. Uh, I've also changed my behavior to try to minimize uh, this happening. I stopped advertising my win rates and records on stream. I mostly stopped creating analysis content about Slay the Spire because I noticed that like I can play a run and enjoy myself and put it out to my viewers and that's fine. But if I like post something about strategy, um, I will start getting harassment. So I stopped posting as much stuff about strategy. And uh, last year, I streamed other games 70% of my stream time. So I've even largely moved away from streaming Slay the Spire at all. Um, but he and his community are still doing this. Uh, and he here has chosen to pull up a Reddit post that I made. Uh, the Reddit post received 2.1 thousand upvotes on the subreddit. Uh, it was immensely appreciated. Uh, most of the comments, and there were many comments, were extremely positive and expressing gratitude for me doing the work of writing up strategy guides for playing all the characters from someone who had a lot of success playing them over the last month. Um, but he's pulled it up and is making fun of me on his channel in front of his audience uh, to it. So my agency isn't causing this to happen. He is choosing to do this. And this is another way in which he's misrepresenting reality here. Skipping ahead a bit to the end. Oh, everybody is so mean to me. Yeah, fucking Kunstück, idiot, man. Um, I think that this is a lovely sign-off from him because he's mockingly impersonating me, but it is an impersonation of me. Uh, I did a charity week recently, and Voxy came on my channel, and Voxy is my friend, and she impersonated me to make fun of me, which is something that, like, between friends, that can be an okay thing to do, and that is a relationship that I have with Voxy. She can get away with doing that. It's really funny. And when she impersonated me, she like, you know, leaned into my speech patterns, the way that I like will have little spaces between words and think about what word to say next, my dry tone, my monotony, etc. And she did a great job of that. And then I said, what the fuck? Because that's kind of what she sounds like. And I was impersonating her back. That's like how you impersonate someone, right? But he's just making the noises that he thinks a crying baby might make. It's not even impersonating me. So reality is so, like, meaningless. It has so little value to him in how he's talking about me that he's not even bothering to make fun of me. He's just presenting something else and making fun of that. Anyway, the reality here is that not everybody is mean to me. And most people in the Slay the Spire community are kind. The posts that he's responding to, again, received net 2.1 thousand upvotes. <laughs> um, however, Adrian has 180 thousand Twitch followers, and his behavior leads to me getting harassed when I participate in larger Slay the Spire community. So it's reasonable for me to be upset by that, I would think. And the harassment has extended to my family being doxxed a couple of times, once on Reddit, and uh, once as a private threat. That, like is beyond like being upset because I'm being bullied into like this is actually endangering me and people I love levels of upset uh like material impact on my life levels of upset of course I'm fucking upset about that the payoff to all of this and kind of the the nasty thing about manipulative arguments like this is couched in all of these false premises and misinterpretations of reality is the statement, that's why he has to eat all this shit. So what Adrian's trying to say is he's trying to say that it's my fault that I'm getting bullied by people, um, which is not a cogent argument, obviously. But a lot of people, like the mechanism of an argument is something that a reasonable person might use to do a reasonable thing, right? And a lot of us are trained when looking at an argument to take it in good faith, assume that the other person is trying to make a good faith argument, and to respond to the argument if we want to disagree with the argument 
the goal is to kind of defeat the conclusion. The goal would be, no, Jorbs doesn't have to eat all this shit. What you said doesn't mean that. But the tricky thing about manipulators when they use arguments is that the argument doesn't matter that much. The reason that the manipulator is creating this argument to begin with is about the way that they are able to frame reality through their argument and not about the payoff at all. The payoff statement in a manipulative argument is tricky because when trying to diffuse the impact of the manipulation, it isn't enough just to refute the payoff. It wouldn't be enough to hear Adrian say this and just say, no, it isn't appropriate to bully someone. You're an adult. We're playing a single player strategy game for fun. That isn't appropriate would be perhaps a reasonable thing to say, but it isn't enough to do that, to fully diffuse what he has done by saying these things in front of a thousand plus people live. Um, Adrian's intent isn't about his argument. His intention is to reframe reality in a way which dehumanizes me. Dehumanizing me allows him to preserve and bolster his ego. And it also allows him to build a community which takes advantage of the proclivity of his viewers to also seek to dehumanize others. That's, at least in my opinion, based on three plus years of enduring this sort of stuff from this particular person, why Adrian does what he does. And he will say that there are lots of other reasons that he does it, which we'll look at later. But... Like the thing that it keeps coming back to is he is warping reality to try to make it so the thing he thinks is important is what he gets and to make himself seem popular and to try to get his viewers to like him and applaud him and watch his channel. Uh, we'll come back to that, but chapter two is next. I want to talk about failures of accountability in the information age. So, if what we deal in in the world is information, then what we're going to war over is information. You deal in spices, you war over spices. You deal in oil, you war over oil. You deal in information, you war over information. Our perception of the world is necessarily incomplete and flawed. We aren't omnipotent, so we can't understand everything that's going on at once. And in our current world, more than ever before, enough information and misinformation circulates for us to come to vastly different conclusions about the world is. Uh, it's no longer like we all agree that the world is like this, given that this behavior is appropriate, which was a more common way of thinking in communities, I would say, 100 years ago. Now, that didn't necessarily mean that they were right about what the world was at, at all, but that was kind of the texture of the argument given that this is true and this is true and this is true, which you and I both agree on, this is a sensible conclusion. Now we live in a world where if I'm talking with someone who even lives in the same country as me but supports a different political candidate, the chances are extremely high that we will not even agree on what the world really is if we try to talk about it. And a lot of the ways in which we don't agree about the what the world really is are just like material things which you could look up. But the thing is that I saw one interpretation of that, and they saw a different interpretation of that. And the interpretations were warped by people trying to manipulate to like, win a war of information. And so now the two of us have irreconcilably, irreconcilable, irreconcilably, is that a word? Irreconcilably different opinions about what the world is. Uh, and because of this, we increasingly have conversations about the present premises upon which we base our understanding of the world rather than the conclusions that follow. Uh, the thing is, I don't think we've ever, as humans, been very good at examining premises. I think if you look at the history of humanity, you find centuries and centuries and millennia of awful, atrocious things being done because we didn't ever examine the premises that we were making our decisions on to begin with. And I don't think we're much better at examining premises now. It's just we are now in a world where more than ever, the premises upon which we're basing our decisions are in flux and warred over. 
So in this world, how do we choose which reality is true? Um, first off, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I think this is kind of the problem for our generation, and I don't know how we're meant to solve it. Uh, some options, though, are kindness. We could do it with kindness. We could do it with cruelty. We could do it with self-interest. We could do it by looking to our role models. We could do it based just on our own experience. We could do it via investigation. Or uh, maybe, if we're really lucky, we could choose which reality is true based on truth somehow. But how you do that once, let alone consistently, I am not entirely sure. One of the problems with choosing a way to decide what reality is, because like for me, if I was going to choose one, I'd probably want to choose kindness, is that choosing reality using kindness runs into the paradox of tolerance. Uh, the paradox of tolerance is something which hopefully, I wouldn't be surprised if most of my viewers have heard of the paradox of tolerance by now. We've been talking more and more about the paradox of tolerance online in the last five plus years, I would say. Uh, but the paradox of tolerance is that if we all choose to forgive and give think the best of others. In a good world, we might end up in the best possible society manageable, everyone just being kind and giving everybody else the benefit of the doubt. But if some people choose to cheat and deceive while everyone else chooses to forgive, our society will instead allow people who cheat and deceive to rise to the top. So we need some way to say, hey, no, this person isn't good, but it's extremely hard to find a good one in online worlds, maybe in the rest of the world too. Um, but especially it feels like that's the case in online communities where a lot of us are faceless and have intermittent engagement with the community. If someone is outed as a bad actor in March, someone in April may never have heard about that and come into contact with them and not know, and how would they? We don't have a great way in online communities to structure that information so it persists and becomes common knowledge to everyone. Mob justice on social media is one way that you might think that you can protect the vulnerable. And it can feel good or at least sufficient to pay attention to conversations online, take part in criticism, bad behavior that you hear about. But because of the nature of online conversation, this results in extremely incomplete distribution of justice. So it's really not a great solution. For example, someone who acted inappropriately a couple of times around members of offline TV might be ostracized from online communities indefinitely. And perhaps that's even appropriate. Uh, but meanwhile, another person who has reasonably been accused of three different sexual assaults might be one of your most watched streamers because their victims didn't have large enough online followings for you to ever hear about them. This is not a pretty picture of justice. Uh, huge frustration for me. I wrote a book largely about sexism and gaming, which published in March of last year, in March 2023, called Before We Go Live. Um, a huge frustration for me in interviewing a lot of my friends was hearing about the Me Too movement that went through social media in the gaming space uh, in 2022, I think late 2021, early 22, somewhere around there. Um, a lot of my friends were people who worked on the back end of the streaming industry in companies which were predominantly men, and they were just sort of expressing there was a very visible feminist movement um, fighting back against sexism in gaming spaces, but the places where it successfully fought back were where like groups of visible women were able to band together and kind of like add up their influence to a point where they reached the threshold where social media paid attention to them. And that just didn't help uh, very much at all for a woman who was working on her own on the uh, back end of the streaming industry, like with an agency managing streamers or something like that. So uh, this doesn't do it. This is not enough. Naive reliance on rules and their enforcement is something that I also see people expressing quite often. Uh, while mob justice isn't a sufficient solution, we also can't rely on platforms to enforce behavioral standards to keep manipulators out of our communities. It might work in small communities with attentive organizers, but it won't work somewhere like YouTube or Twitch. Uh, I can speak about this from personal experience. Uh, a guy has been harassing me on Twitch for three years, and I have tried to bring that to their attention multiple times and reported clips from his channel and stuff like that, and he's still doing it. Um, so when I'm like, hey, 
this guy is harassing me and people are like, well, why don't you do something about it? I'm like, I am doing something about it. This is kind of the best thing I can do is tell you. <laughs> um, let's try to reestablish reality in a way that makes a little bit more sense. You are the steward of your reality and you hold responsibility for what it does to the world. This is my opinion. Expecting someone who's been sexually assaulted, for example, to seek justice via social media or an HR department are both unreasonable. <laughs> Instead, perhaps the best thing that you can do is reassert that you see and believe in the reality that they have presented to you and that you will not personally support the person who has done this to them. You pay attention to what is going on, do a good job of understanding what is real and what isn't, and choose to promote people who do good and criticize people who do bad, you can still make a difference even in the gigantic world we live in today. That is something that I believe extremely, extremely strongly. Anytime that I talk about like believing victims, there is a small subset of, I mean, I talk with a lot of strategy gamers, so usually they're strategy gamers and usually they're men. Um, but there's a small subset of people who are like, well, it could be a false accusation. You have to think about like the possibility of a false accusation. You shouldn't punish somebody unjustly, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Which is absolutely true. <laughs> absolutely true. It could be possible for someone to be extremely manipulative and to use the vehicle of accusing someone of a crime to manipulate them. Because accusing someone of a crime is a reasonable thing that a reasonable person could do. It is something that people might do if a crime has been engaged in, right? But, but that's just the thing. Reasonable things you can do, which would be done by reasonable people, we have to have those in our communities for our communities to function. We can't have a default belief about somebody using that tool be that they are a manipulator and that's why they're using it. And it's tremendously sexist and negative and dysfunctional to believe that if somebody accuses someone else of a hurtful crime against them in our communities, like a default assumption should be that they're making it up to manipulate us. It's also like... It's also sexist and hypocritical because at the same time, there are all sorts of other people in our communities using all sorts of other reasonable avenues for human interaction, which reasonable people might use to legitimately manipulate you. And yet you look at somebody doing one of those things and you're just like, oh yeah, sure, of course, of course. Yeah, like that person just said that Jorbs was a fucking idiot he said a bunch of things which he claimed were factually true about Jorbs. Um, that's reasonable. Uh, we don't have to examine that at all. Kinds of things. Uh, yeah. It's hard, though. It's hard when we have manipulators in our communities to trust the reasonable avenues of human interaction to be used by reasonable humans because instead they are being used by manipulators. Uh, but it's deeply sexist to think that woman accusing someone of sexual assault is the sensible place to be looking for manipulators all the time. That's probably not the right way to be going about it. Chapter 3. Strategy gamers can be masterful at not being manipulators too. Some hope for a second. Also perhaps some frustration. Uh, some strategy games are cooperative or single player. In the same way that strategy games select for people who are excellent at competing against others in pursuit of a personal goal, they also select for people who are excellent at collaborating with others in pursuit of a shared goal. Strategy games are actually extremely well equipped to navigate reality together if they can align their goals successfully. We've learned all about how to use the resources around us to get something that we want. All we need to do is agree that we're going to respect each other and ask other people around us if they want the same things that we do. And then we can collaborate and be incredible and do incredible things together. We are so well situated to do this. Remember when I talked about prejudice and outgrouping and how strategy games had some proclivity toward that behavior happening? 
Well, strategy games are able to provide some of the most powerful evidence against prejudice out of like anything in the world. They can serve as a language which crosses cultural barriers in which all players are treated fairly by the game and all players can ask and answer questions about the same experience. Uh, when Indian chess players started to do incredibly, incredibly well, uh, and like there was an Indian chess world champion, there was no room for prejudice to say like, no, only white people can play chess. Like, no, there is clearly an Indian person who is the world champion right now. He has beaten all the white people. Chess went from being a sport which was spoken about in terms of the Cold War between the U.S. and the USSR when Fischer and Spassky were playing their world championship match to being a much more global sport with people represented from all sorts of areas of the globe with representation, representation of women as well in it. And a large part of why it was able to do that was that the rules apply fairly to everyone when you're actually playing a game of chess. The ways in which a game of chess is prejudiced and unfair are created by the humans involved in the game of chess while the game of chess is happening and perhaps before the game of chess happened in deciding who has the ability to learn chess as a kid, in deciding who can make it to the tournament, and deciding who gets harassed for trying to do so, etc. But all we really need to do as strategy gamers is get out of the way. <laughs> and let the strategy games show that prejudice isn't right. If we just stop injecting the strategy games with our own prejudice, the strategy gaming communities can be full of people of all different ethnicities, from all different backgrounds, of all different genders, all succeeding at the games, because there just isn't actually a reason that people of all sorts of types can't succeed in strategy games. The games themselves are not the thing that's stopping people from doing that. So, my advice is stop caring about who wins or who is currently best, and instead use games to connect with people different from you and learn from the ways they approach, engage with, and enjoy those games. One of the most valuable things about games, given that they can connect us to people who aren't the same as us, is that we can learn things from those people about life beyond the game that we are playing. We can play a game of chess against someone who's 70 years old, even though we're like 13, and hear life lessons from them because we're connecting over a shared experience where we can see that within this game board we are equals, and then we have created a context within which we can have a conversation over that game board in which we treat each other with respect as well. Next up, limerence. Limerence is a way that we dehumanize people sometimes, but few people are more thoughtful about their emotional state than strategy gamers, in my opinion. We talk about things like tilt and performing under pressure and competitive edge all the time, uh, the idea that you have an emotional state and it affects your ability to perform at your best is native to the strategy gamer's language. And I think if you go read Love and Limerence, which is a great book, it punches really hard really early and keeps punching, and you learn about limerence, uh, not everybody experiences limerence, but a lot of you will be like, oh, that's an emotional state that I've been in over the course of my life. Uh, it'll be valuable to you to understand about that emotional state. And... Once you get through limerence and you understand what's going on, uh, strategy gamers understand many tools and structures for team building and how to play well with a teammate. And that's actually a perfect starting point, in my opinion, for building a healthy romantic relationship with someone if you want to. So strategy gamers can be awesome at romantic relationships if they want to be. Um, just because they are more able to act in an evil, manipulative way if they have a crush on someone and don't think of that person as a human being it doesn't mean that strategy gamers aren't also capable of being incredible partners in romantic relationships. What about ego, defense, and self-idealization? So some of us got most invested in strategy games because of their challenge, and we wanted to be the best at them. Um, but I would bet that all of us were first attracted to games because they were fun. I feel like the first time you sat down and got engrossed in a game, it was probably because you thought it was really enjoyable. Far, far, far before you started thinking, I want to be the best in the world or the neighborhood or the school or the town or whatever at this game. And I think, and, and this speaks to my own experience somewhat as someone who at some point in his life cared a lot about being very good at strategy games 
And nowadays I care much, much, much more about learning strategy games and challenging myself with strategy games. Um, I find that if my ego is invested in my results, fortunately I'm already in a place where I can easily extract it because like, I'm doing something which is fun. There is something valuable to what I am doing, what I have invested so much time in, other than my results. It's fun. It's recreational. It's an enjoyable activity. And so perhaps if you're struggling with ego defense and self-idealization, you could focus on some silly challenges or try some games of a different genre, which you know you're bad at, so the pressure is off for you to perform. And if you care about yourself having fun, you'll find that you care about yourself again. If you had lost yourself in this idea, I have to be the best League of Legends player, that's my identity, you might not be caring super much about yourself. Um, maybe you're letting responsibilities go in life, etc., etc., etc. But I have found that once I am really enjoying myself and having fun, that's when the rest of me like wakes up. And it's like, wait, I'm a full human being, a full human being who can have fun. How I feel matters. I should sleep better. I should eat better. I should get outside more. I should go for walks. I should spend time with my friends. Um, games for me have provided a springboard for me to get out of the hardest moments of my life uh, in terms of my emotional state and get back to being a happy person because they are a shelter within which I can spend time when I'm like really not feeling great. But also as a shelter, they are fun and they care about me and my enjoyment. And once I start enjoying myself in a game, all of a sudden I can be like, wait, there's so much more than feeling bad. Let's talk about opponents. The way I think about opponents and the way that I've been framing opponents recently for myself is actually by thinking about a completely different dichotomy, which is um, in conversation, what percentage of your energy are you spending listening versus talking? A long time ago, and this is probably why I became a content creator, who knows, uh, a long time ago I would spend like 90% of my energy in conversation talking. And so I'm like pretty good at that. Uh, it's something that I practiced way more than I should have as a teenager, um, when I should have just been listening to other people because I was a uh, like idiot. I was a stupid teenager, you know? Um, but nowadays when I'm actually having a conversation with another person, I find that it's a lot more enjoyable to spend maybe 30% of my energy on talking and the rest of my energy I'm spending on listening. I'll often be in conversations with people and it can be kind of awkward because they'll finish saying something and I just like won't have anything to say because I've been spending all of my energy thinking about what they're saying and listening to it and trying to like construct my understanding of who they are and what's important to them and what the world is like for them because I think that's really interesting. I want to get to know them and understand what's important to them. Um, but while I'm doing all of that, they've like been talking and then they stop talking and they're like, so now you go. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> I, I forgot I had to talk too. Um, so that's currently where I sit. Um, probably I should go more toward 50-50. Probably I'm spending too much energy on listening, honestly, but that's where I'm at right now. Um, and I think the same sort of dichotomy is present in gaming with other people to some extent. So nowadays I'm thinking what percentage of my energy am I spending on competing with people I'm playing a game with versus what percentage of my energy am I spending connecting with them and, and learning from them. Because I think both of those modes are very important in games. This is a huge part of why I don't play many multiplayer games online. I prefer to play single player games where my connection with other people is via talking to like my viewers in a chat window because multiplayer games online you will be paired with other human beings but like everybody's kind of there to play the game often the game doesn't even support connecting with other humans in any way like you can't even chat with them maybe there are emotes but everybody has them muted because they just get used to troll other people who knows uh, when I do my multiplayer gaming, I prefer to do it in person, over board games, stuff like that. And I also try to make sure that if I'm playing games like that with other people, I get to take at least a moment to like say hi to everybody, introduce myself, ask how they're doing, maybe get to know them a little bit better. And then if we've played games together a few times, maybe at that point we start like opening up a little bit and becoming friends and really learning a lot about each other that way. So that's something that I keep an eye on 
in my gaming with other people. I don't want to be gaming in a way where other people are just my opponents. I want to be gaming in a way where I'm connecting with other people if other people are going to be involved in my gaming. And I find that if you spend more energy on learning from others and less on competing against them, you start humanizing and empathizing with them very quickly. So I don't think that our proclivity to dehumanizing other humans as opponents in strategy gaming is fatal to strategy gaming as a community at all. And I think that this is a good way to think about it in your own life to try to make sure that you are humanizing other people instead. Money. Strategy games teach us a lot about resources and vulnerability. And as strategy gamers, we are well prepared to recognize people who are in need and people who have plenty. Instead of letting people who feel pressured by money feel like they are on their own struggling to survive, we can try to reach out to those around us and help them in the same way that we can pursue our goals we can find out what would help others and think about whether we'd be good at helping them get it. It is just true that human beings around us are going to be struggling sometimes, not just with money, but also with other problems. And I think that the fact that we are capable of looking at a like complicated game and saying, oh, here's a strategy to win from this situation, we can use those same sorts of skills to look at someone who is troubled by something and get a sense for how we might be able to support them. This is a skill that you have to develop separate from strategy games. A lot of the time when you're offering to support to someone, they don't want you to like solve their problem like you're playing a strategy game. But it is a skill which you can learn in the same way that you learned the skill of playing strategy games. You can learn to listen. You can learn to provide the support, which is appropriate. You can learn to both appreciate other people's boundaries, but also appreciate how you can act favorably for them within their boundaries in a place that makes them comfortable. These are all things that strategy gamers can do. We can spend time raising money for charity. We can spend time building support groups. We can spend time socializing and making sure that people are in good places socially. None of this is fatal to strategy gaming. In fact, if we think about what strategy gamers' capabilities are, I think that as a community, we are very capable of being very good at a lot of these things. Um, <clears throat> now we're going to be negative again for a while. I think... I think that people just don't really understand very well what it is like for someone to manipulate your reality unless they have been exposed to it. And I am not going to be able to express to you what it's like for someone to just like nonstop lie and misrepresent you to thousands of people for three years. I I'm not going to be able to express that to you in one video. There's no way you can fully get that without going through it for three years. I, I don't really think. I mean, you'd get most of it by going through it for the first six months. <laughs> but the way in which you can be abused and manipulated in abusive relationships and just by other people who are abusing and manipulating you outside of those relationships as well um, is really hard for people who have never been personally attacked in that way to understand. And there are two things that come from that. One is people who haven't had this experience do not understand what someone's going through when that person expresses that it is happening to them. Uh, you might think, oh, I mean, I've been made fun of in my life. It isn't that bad. I got over it. Um, or you might think, oh, they're just exaggerating. It's not really a very big deal or something like that. I don't know. I don't know. But it's really hard to get it unless you've been there. Um, the other thing is if all of a sudden you're there, if this starts happening to you, if someone is abusing you and manipulating your reality and telling lies about you to all of the other people around you and stuff like that, spreading rumors, making false claims, um, disparaging you, defaming you, etc., 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 if someone starts doing that, like the response that you have to that, the emotional response you'll have to what is happening to your reality can be really strong and overwhelming, and you may find yourself in a situation where you don't believe that it's happening to you, where you believe that a lot of it is your fault. Um, that's one of the ways in which people who are masterful manipulators 
really dig their claws into you is they will identify your insecurities and make them bigger and bigger and bigger in your eyes to a point where you feel like you deserve this sort of treatment and actually this is your fault and how could someone listening to you describe this support you given how awful you've been um, in this new reality that is false but has been created for you. And so I wanted to just give some examples of how people manipulate. Because when my friend came to me and said, hey, I'm being manipulated by this guy in this relationship, I was shocked and I was angry. Uh, but my friend said, I'm going to deal with it myself. And I thought, okay, I trust you. I'm here to support you, but I'm not going to like butt in, right? And after my friend said, I'm going to deal with it myself, like a couple days passed, and then they came to me with an email that they had been sent by this person who was manipulating and abusing them. And they said, see, this is the sort of thing that's happening. Um, and if I remember right, maybe not that time, but maybe other times, they would often express like, oh, I can't like, I can't like take this to Twitch or whatever though, because look at all the awful things that I've done. Um, I could really like, this could look bad for me. This person could release our private chat logs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Like they had been in their relationship, so they had spoken about very personal stuff. This person could share my secrets, et cetera. Um, and what I did with my friend that was very powerful and helped a lot, or at least they said it helped a lot, I believe it helped a lot, was I just actually went through the email sentence by sentence and every single one of the sentences misrepresented reality warped what was happening, lied about what was going on in a way that tried to get something from my friend that would favor the person abusing them. Every single sentence. And I want to go through a like 20 minute long, I might call this a rent, I don't know, um, that Adrian had about me on his stream. This isn't the only time that he has done this. <laughs> um, I'm not trying to present this as like, this is all of the evidence of him harassing me ever. Um, this is just one that I have because somebody happened to save it. I didn't even know it had happened until they shared it with me like a couple of years after the fact when I was like, hey, this guy's been harassing me. They were like, oh yeah, he like really says some wild shit. Like here's an example of it that was so wild that I actually like kept a link to it. So that's how I have this. I didn't even know what was going on. Uh, when it happened, and I want to share it with you and talk about the ways in which reality is constantly being warped and the ways in which, like, who I am is being lied about over the course of this segment. So we're going to go through it, like, basically sentence by sentence. And, yeah. I don't know. Talking about win rate once coach started slaughtering everyone. All right, here we go. What Martino says, uh, I will be honest, but it feels like everyone else stopped talking about win rate once coach started slaughtering everyone on win rate. Naya, look, this is this is a funny thing, right? I mean, that's also one of the. I mean, you know that I'm I don't like jobs very much, right? I mean, not like I mean nowadays it, I don't mind too much, but I really like I, I dislike him out of many reasons, right? But when I started Slay the Spire, like playing Slay the Spire, that's over a year ago, right? And so um, I also, I didn't watch him actively, but I just wanted to check how other players do, right? And I found like a stream of jobs and that's probably already like uh, one and a half years ago or something, right? And he did like a 100 run samples at that point. And he usually ran that down and then checked always his last 100 runs with every character. And regarding win rate right all right stop for a moment so the context here adrian is another slay the spire streamer he's just had a personal best performance on ironclad he's been playing the game for i don't know maybe a year and a half is what he said just then i will trust him on that i don't know he's quite a good slay the spire player uh he's a very good strategy gamer he has succeeded in strategy games for his entire adult life, really. He did well in Hearthstone. He did well in poker. 
Um, at no point do I want to present to you the idea that Adrian is not a good and successful strategy gamer. In fact, if anything, I want to present to you the idea that he is a good and successful strategy gamer. And then I want to present to you the way in which he talks about the reality of who I am. Um, so this is like the first sentence that I wrote down. He did 100 run samples at that point. He usually ran that down. And then he checked his last 100 runs with every character regarding win rate. Um, this is something that he states about me just as fact. Um, the reason that he's doing this is that Adrian came into the community and said that win rate was the thing that you had to look for to decide who was the best at Slay the Spire and started saying that he was better than the other players because he had a higher win rate and he started being extremely dismissive of everybody else in the community who didn't play to try to maximize their win rate as much as possible. And you might think, you might think, oh, well, I'm a reasonable person uh, thinking about that. Yeah, it seems kind of reasonable that in order to see who the best player of a game is, you would see what percentage of the time they won, and the person who won the higher percent was the best player of the game. That does seem kind of reasonable, right? But this is, from the beginning, just fundamentally not how it works. It's just not how games work. We don't talk about the percentage of the time that somebody wins in like competitive games to decide who is the best player. You could think about like in Magic the Gathering, they have tournaments, right? And so tournaments are not about what percentage of the time that you win. And who wins the tournament is about who wins on the day, who shows up with the best deck and plays the best for that tournament. Um, but, you know, thinking about Magic, sometimes you do have like what is this player's win percentage on the pro tour over the course of their career? Sometimes you will have a statistic like that. So maybe you'll think, oh, he means something like that. So like, what is this player's win percentage in Slay the Spire over the course of their career? Sure. But even within Magic where they do that, where they have a competitive environment where people play and you play over a long enough time that you can talk about win rate in Magic, they are talking about games played on the pro tour or games played in Grand Prix. No one is looking at somebody's win rate over the last three years playing on Magic the Gathering Arena to try to say that they are the best Magic player in the world. Because like conceptually, we understand that a lot of the time that people are playing the game, like they're not trying as hard as they could, or they're practicing, or they're trying out a new strategy, or learning a new deck for a tournament that they want to play later, or maybe they're chilling out with a friend, or maybe they're playing for fun. Sometimes you might want to play for fun and not be focused on your win rate at all. And so this idea to begin with, that you should measure every player of Slay the Spire's win rate and then say who is better and who is worse based on what their win rate is, is just senseless. It just, from the beginning, isn't something that the other people in the community other than Adrian are all wanting. And unless everybody wants that and is trying to make their win rate as high as they possibly can in service of it, it doesn't usefully compare players to one another. Um, this isn't a competitive thing. So I needed to say all of that. I know that was a lot of talking, but like that's like what reality is. Um, and you know, he's, he's going to say that that isn't what reality is. That's what he's going to do. But, but first he said that I used to do 100 run samples. I usually ran that down and then checked my last hundred runs with every character regarding win rate. And I just want to say like, I've never done that. I, I don't entirely know what he's talking about. I certainly have looked at my results in my life, but in terms of like caring deeply about what my rune rate was on characters of the last hundred runs that is not a thing that i have done not to my knowledge anyway um it it sounds a bit like he's identifying that the game has a run history and you can look at what your previous runs have looked like um and like using the fact that I have looked at that in my life to imply that that is something that is deeply, deeply important to me, but it is not something that's deeply, deeply important to me. And I've spoken pretty openly for my entire time playing Slay the Spire that like a lot of the time I just vibe with the game. 
I like to go for win streaks as a way to prove that I'm really good at the game because I can vibe with the game most of the time. And then if I'm starting on a win streak, I can try to play harder to try to extend the win streak. And for a long time, I did really want win streaks. And then eventually, largely in response to the community becoming inhabited by people who are toxically competitive, I like really moved away from caring about win streaks at all. And nowadays, I really just play the game um, and the vibe. Uh, and I would say that a lot of the way that I present that I'm very good at the game at this point is in like my ability to talk about it and teach it to other people. And I do track like my results. I recently went 80 and three to unlock all of the ascensions on a new account. So it's not like I'm bad at the game, but like I'm not even trying to begin with to say that I'm better than other people at the game. It's just a very weird situation to be put in to have somebody insist that you compete with them at the game and insist that it be done in a certain way and then also insist that in the past you have done it in that way, which I haven't. Okay. So his win rates were at the time this could be a long video. at 40%, with the silent and defect 30%, but these are pre-patched, so these would be better now, of course, as you can also see. And uh, he had like 48% with the Watcher, right? And the Watcher and the Ironclad were nearly not nearly didn't get patched, right? So this 40% on the Ironclad, 50% on the Watcher, or 48% on the Watcher were actually genuine. Mm. And he was... He... Okay. So I don't know what those numbers are. Maybe there is... Like, I will believe that there was somewhere that those numbers were appropriate. I don't personally remember it. Uh, and there's no citation being given to me. Um, when Ascension 20 with Heart came out, like a very, very, very good win rate for players was like in the 25 to 30% range. And so, uh, seeing that I had those win rates on those characters for the Heart, I think he's talking about a year and a half ago, like that doesn't sound preposterous at all. Um, but that was like a long, long time ago, even at the time that he's talking about this. Uh, in this clip and it's unclear why it would matter and also I didn't care that much about it I don't think he was bragging with those scores he was like hey look at these scores these are freaking crazy win rates you can watch it back I mean if you find it but um, um, I can just tell you yeah because I I can remember numbers very well so okay we're kind of having to go sentence by sentence here. Uh, he, he negatively characterizes me and the way that I'm talking about my scores, right? He was bragging with those scores. So I am, like, here attempting impartially to describe reality. I am one of the best Slay the Spire players in the world. I have played over 8,000 hours of the game. I have sat in the high teens of world record streaks in the game. My win rates on characters, I have never like sat down and so what Adrian does to establish his win rates is he will sit down and he'll practice a character for a bit and then he'll like play 50 runs in a row of that character and often spend like six hours per run, which is fine as a way to make content, but like n other people aren't going to do that. So it's weird to then compare yourself to them. But even still, like, even without doing that, my win rates have typically been, like, within 5% of the top players, or at times they have been, like, the top. And I'm not trying to say that I'm better than other people with any of this. I'm not trying to be competitive in Slay the Spire. I'm just trying to say that, like, I do have good results in Slay the Spire and have over the course of my time playing Slay the Spire, and sometimes I do like to celebrate them and I think that it's cool to do well at games. And all of this is completely <laughs> fine and reasonable. And so describing me looking at my results as bragging about the scores is like a very negative characterization of me. And it's like all of these tiny, small details that add up over the course of years <laughs> where just every single time reality is being warped to be like just a little bit more negative than it was before, which add up to this sort of manipulation and harassment. 
Um, yeah. So he's like bragging about his win rates and like here, look at this, and this is how sick I am. Uh, the usual, you know, the, the usual job stuff, right? Okay, hold on. We need to. I skipped. Right. So these forty percent on the ironclad, fifty percent on the watcher, or forty-eight percent on the watcher were actually genuine. Mm. And he was he was bragging with those scores. He was like, "Hey, look at these scores. These are freaking crazy win rates." You can watch it back. I mean, if you find it, but um, um, I can just tell you, yeah, because I I can remember numbers very well. So, so Adrian is not a journalistic authority about my life, right? And he's just kind of making a ton of shit up about me right now. And here he's just kind of like stating to his audience that he is an authority about me. Like, he doesn't need to provide a citation for saying a bunch of stuff which is basically defamatory about me. You should just trust him. Um, you can watch it back if you find it. But he's not going to show it to you. Um, he's not actually discussing a real behavior that he's showing his viewers that I have. He's, he's just, like, saying that it's out there somewhere makes it hard for me to respond to it. it makes it very hard for a viewer watching him to be like well actually you're framing that really negatively dude oh, he's like bragging about his win rates and like here look at this and this is how sick i am uh, the usual you know the, the usual job stuff right um okay again <laughs> this is extremely negative characterization of me the usual job stuff i what <laughs> So he's presented himself as an authority about me, and now he is presenting like me looking at my results a year and a half ago and being happy about them as me bragging and saying that I'm really good, etc., etc., etc. And this is an extremely negative characterization of me, but he's just presented himself as an authority about me. Um, and there are lots of ways to characterize me that don't have to be negative. Uh, in the year which this is recorded, I did a climate charity year. I was doing charity work every single month. Uh, I've collaborated a ton with other Spire streamers. Around the time that he's talking about my win rates being published, I did a charity week where I had a different Spire streamer on every day, and we raised like $25,000 or something for International Medical Corps. I don't remember exactly what the number was. Maybe it wasn't 25000 That seems high for that time of my life, but uh, like... It was great. Uh, he could have mentioned that. Uh, he could have mentioned the huge amount of analytical work that I've done in the game. Like he could have engaged with some form of analysis that I'd done and been like, you know, I thought this analysis was pretty good. I think we could even get more into this thing. You know, there are lots of ways that he could engage with me, but he's choosing to engage with me in the most negative way possible. He's talking about something a year and a half ago which he's like choosing to put in extremely as negative light possible basically he's talking about me in my own content looking at my results page right now and we're getting into disparaging me and attacking my character and um saying that this generalizes like this is the usual job stuff look at me i'm faking the sicko yeah uh, this is my dick it's so long you know i mean he's not exactly saying that but he's pretty much saying that He's not exactly saying that, but he's pretty much saying that. I, I think this is a really interesting sentence because something that's fascinating to me when watching manipulators um, manipulate is manipulators will frequently just openly state that they're doing it. So in service of Adrian's goal of framing reality about me in a certain way, he's conceded that I haven't actually said the thing that he's saying. I haven't actually done that. But then in the same sentence, he's reasserted. Um, but I basically did say that. Like, no, I have never talked about how I have a giant dick uh, on my channel because my win rates are so high on Slay This Fire. I, that is like so extremely, that is such a massive mixed characterization of me. That is just not something that I would ever do. People who have watched my content would be dumbfounded if I ever did that. Like, what a weird claim to make about something that I have done. But here he is, like, just literally saying that I've done that, 
And then he will say in the same sentence, well, he didn't actually do that. That's not actually what he said, but he basically did do that, which is telling you um, just very directly that he is framing what I'm doing this way. It isn't something that I've actually done. And so we've rapidly gone from me looking at my results for a game that I play, Slay the Spire, uh, to me bragging about my penis size while establishing that Adrian is an authority on who I am. It didn't take us long at all to get from the start of the clip to here. And um, so now we are getting to Slay the Spire, right? And we are, of course, uh, having a, like, we are also going for win rates, and these are much higher. And OK. Now we're getting into Slay the Spire, and we are also going for win rates, and these are much higher. Uh, so number one, also going for win rates. Huh? <laughs> also going for, but, okay. But I was never going for win rates, but okay. He's saying also to reassert that that is something that I was doing, even though I was not doing that. And maybe it's, maybe it's worth just like contextualizing this when he goes for win rates what he does is he plays one character at a time he practices the character first and then he plays very deliberately like six hour long runs like 50 in a row and tries to get as high a win rate as he possibly can and i have never ever done that like i play rotating runs like an hour and a half long i've displayed multiple times that i can play a four hour long run if you look at like my longest win streak, sometimes the runs are more like three or four hours. And I also have over-explained runs where I go for hours. And I have like four per day runs when I play one floor at a time every day and spend an hour on each floor, even if it's like a chest that I just have to open. So I can play really long runs to try to make my win rate higher, but I've never done that. So when he's like saying that now he's got it into Slay the Spire and he's also going for win rates, like, like that's something that I was doing and now he's doing it too. It's extremely, extremely misleading. And then, right after doing that, um, he says, and his win rates are much higher, which is just a lie. So Adrian did very well on Watcher early when he started playing Slay the Spire. And to his credit, he is a very good strategy gamer. And he is quite good at Slay the Spire. Um, but Watcher released around the same time that Adrian started playing Slay the Spire seriously. So like none of the established players had like a leg up on him for playing Watcher specifically, really. Okay, so sure, if he's going to start playing Watcher when she releases like that, and he's going to practice really hard, and then he's going to play six hour long runs, 50 in a row of Watcher, it makes sense that he's probably going to be an extremely good Watcher player at that point, maybe even the best Watcher player in the world. That just kind of makes sense because he's a very good strategy game player and Watcher just released and he just spent hundreds and hundreds of hours learning and perfecting the character. Perfecting is a bit strong, but like learning and getting better at the character that other people like haven't put in that time for yet. Um, but at that time when he was also going for win rates, um, his win rates were not in general much higher than other people's. Um, which is just kind of obvious if you are a reasonable person and you just think about any game ever. Uh, other people had been playing the other characters for like a year or two at this point, and he came in and he had not been. And so like his first runs on Ironclad, Silent, and Defect were not just all him doing way, way, way better than anybody else had before. They were all him having substantially lower win rates than the people who had been practicing the characters for a year or two, because the other people are good at strategy games too. This is just kind of like obvious, straightforward. That's just kind of factually, conceptually how reality kind of has to work. Uh, and if you believe this guy saying that his win rates on the other characters were better than the people who had played the game for multiple years, like right when he started playing the game, like, one of the ways that you have to defend against people being manipulative of reality is you have to be able to say sometimes, like, wait a second, no. There's no realistic way that that makes any sense whatsoever. And that's just something that doesn't make any realistic sense whatsoever. Um, for what it's worth, though, he was claiming at the time that his win rates were higher than other people's on the other characters as well. <laughs> 
Um, so here's, for example, frustrated DM evidence of that from December 12th, 2020. I have exchanged one and a half DM conversations with Adrian. The first one was like, hey, I heard you talking about my me on your channel. You were misrepresenting my win rates. Uh, here's what they actually are for what it's worth. But also I would like just kind of prefer that you not talk about my win rates on your channel because I don't try to maximize my win rates a ton. I try generally to be a like enjoyable Slay the Spire streamer who does their best. Um, that was my first exchange with him and he was like, okay, great, thanks. Um, this is at the start of my grudges video on YouTube if you want to see the exact wording of all of these exchanges. Um, but the start of my second exchange with him was after people had come into my channel to harass me about him because he had spent something like 15 minutes the previous night talking about specifically me and how bad my win rates were um, on his channel. And so I looked. I looked at what my win rate was, and I looked at what his win rate was. And over the last 80 runs, I had 147 of them, and he had 135 of his. So this has not at any point interfaced with reality. And I want to make it clear when I say that, I'm not trying to say that I'm better at Slay the Spire than Adrian. I am not trying to say that like currently my win rate on all the characters is better than Adrian's win rate on all of the characters or anything like that. I'm not trying to say that if we were in a tournament together, I would beat him. I'm not trying to say any of those things. What I'm trying to say is that his opinion of his ability at Slay the Spire and other people's opinion of Slay the Spire does not weave with reality. It does not respect or correspond to reality. He just makes it up for you. Um, yeah, and, and that's basically always what he's been doing in my experience. Okay. Suddenly, the goalposts are getting like somehow switched, and suddenly win rates are not important at all. And suddenly, it's only like he is only talking about streaks and bullshit like this, right? And all right, next sentence. It really is sentence by sentence. Um, so for starters, uh, win streaks have been the main. Competitive metric in Slay the Spire since Solarity sat on 50 on Twitch for a month or something before the Ascension system was even released. Win streaks are a well known competitive um, metric for roguelikes in general. Um, I came to Slay the Spire from FTL, where win streaks were the main competitive metric. Win streaks are just a common way for people to compete at roguelikes. They're fun, they're entertaining, people like watching them. And this has been true since before I started playing Slay the Spire, let alone since before Adrian started playing Slay the Spire. Okay. Um, so it's really hard at this point to unravel. Like, is there some sort of miscommunication going on here somewhere? And and what does he even mean exactly, or what it has to do with anything else? Um, because he's making so much stuff up. And he is so liberally making stuff up that as I was reviewing this video, I was starting to wonder, like, what is, what is he talking about? What is going on? Because um, it's it's so hard to disentangle the different things that he's saying. Like, I could respond maybe to all of a sudden win rates are not important at all, and all of a sudden he is only talking about streaks. If that was all that he said in his sentence, right? But in every sentence, like, He's tweaking the framing of so many different things as negatively as he possibly can. So his sentence doesn't just make the false claim that I used to care about win rates, and then when he got better win rates than me, which he didn't yet, <laughs> remember, he didn't even do that. Then when he got better win rates than me, supposedly, allegedly, in his opinion, what he's saying, what he's claiming, um, it's not even saying that when he got better win rates than me, I stopped talking about win rates and started focusing on streaks. It's also at the same time saying that streaks are bullshit. But streaks are like an established competitive metric for roguelikes since before Slay the Spire existed and have been all over the Slay the Spire community for like the entire time that people have been playing Slay the Spire. And this is just verifiable. You can just like look up like YouTube world record streaks slay the spire and there's a video with like probably hundreds of thousands of views 
and there's like videos of me talking with the other Slay the Spire players about our win streaks. Like if you look up Terrence and Baylor Lord and Jorbs talking about their rotating world record streaks, you'll find us talking about those for three hours. It's like <laughs> there are so many, it's like he's juggling, juggling false reality balls all over the place. And every time he catches one, he tweaks it even further um, into falsehood. It's really remarkable. Okay, right, next. I mean, this it doesn't stop there, right? But he also kind of propagates that, right? Like also everywhere, like uh, suddenly saying that win do not matter at all and win streaks are so much more. And I mean, they are... For what it's worth, other than like the suddenly and the impression that I started doing this now, like he is right that I have said throughout my time as a Slay the Spire player, that win streaks are more important than win rates. Um, and the reason that I do that is that they're a much more accessible competitive metric. Like anybody can go for a win streak, whereas for a win rate, you kind of have to like focus for hundreds of hours. Um, so I cared mostly about win streaks when they were like eight wins long. And it was like, like any player could get a, a win streak in like under a week. And that's really exciting and it's really cool. And lots of different people were putting together win streaks and it was a fun competitive scene. And Crimson Blur came in and tried to get 10-0 rotating for the first time and spent six months on it. And it was a huge thing. And there was a huge Reddit post about it when he succeeded. And that was great. This was like competitive Slay the Spire in a functional form. Um, and yes, I have pretty much always been saying that but because he's framed this idea that first i used to care about win rates and then now i'm saying that about win streaks he's created a narrative where the reason that i'm now saying that people care about win streaks which again have been a major competitive metric in slay the spire since the game came out not just for me but for many other players um but now he's framing it that now i'm saying that i care about win streaks um in like response to what he's done which yeah there are only two true. two options you know i mean the one option is that he's a complete fucktard like uh, an idiot right but i just assume i mean i cut him that slack that he isn't i mean he seems to be like a clever person to me or at least like not completely dumb you know so i need to assume that he's doing that on purpose right okay so this is this is something called a false dichotomy what he's doing now. There are only two options. Here I am, a human being he has never met. He doesn't know me. He's exchanged one and a half DMs with me. We haven't had a conversation. I've made myself accessible for conversation. He could have talked to me and asked me things and gotten like an answer to what I think and things like that. If he wanted, if an important project for him was to care a lot about win rates and slay the spire and see what sort of win rate other people could achieve. Like he's a self-proclaimed multi-millionaire poker player. Why didn't he set up a tournament where it was like for a month, I am going to make it so people can play 50 games on a character and I will pay people $500 for every win that they get out of those 50 games. If he wanted to see what people could achieve in terms of win rate in the Slay the Spire community, he could have incentivized that behavior and gotten people to do that. But he didn't, right? Um, so anyway, um, having not done that, having not incentivized it in any way, and instead like just constantly disparaged the other people in the community and said negative things about them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, He's now creating a false dichotomy for me, where he believes there are only two explanations for my behavior. He doesn't actually believe this, I don't think. Sometimes it's kind of hard to tell. With manipulators, they can get a false sense of reality for themselves, as well as imposing their false sense of reality on other people. But I don't think he actually thinks there are only two possible explanations for this. Um, but he's saying that he thinks that there are only two possible explanations for this, and like we'll take him on his word for that, I guess. Um, but he's saying that one possibility is that I'm a complete fucktard. I'm an idiot. Um, I don't know why that would explain this, <laughs> really. I'm not sure. Um, but anyway, the other explanation, in his opinion, 
is that I'm doing it on purpose, which I at least interpret to mean he thinks that I am kind of like warping reality against him, which maybe makes sense to him in his mind because he thinks perhaps that warping reality is something that people regularly do. You have to like... I think that it says something of a person's mindset that like he had a personal project in the Slay the Spire community. He really wanted to care about Winrate and wanted other people to care about Winrate. And then when somebody didn't want to do that, his only explanations that he could come up with for why they wouldn't want to do it were one, that person is an idiot, or two, that person is manipulating me. In terms of like the plane of possible human experience and motivation, uh, those are two very narrow points of human motivation and two extremely specific ones to uh, what seems to be going on here, where he seems to think that he's better than other people, and he seems to think that manipulating other people is just like a normal context of life. Um, but yeah, another very simple explanation. Um, to explain what he is presenting as only possibly being explained by two things in the false dichotomy. And like the reality is that he invented the focus flip and basically nobody competed over winner since like this by before he arrived in the community. And there were some minor conversations about it and some reporting, but there are absolutely no win rate competitions. And I am close to 100% certain that all of that is true. Like competition in Slay the Spire existed for win streaks, but Prior to him coming to the community, I don't think anybody really competed over win rates. And while he presents the idea that now people do compare over, compete over win rates, they kind of still don't. There are very few people who are like, I am going to play only one character and I am going to play 50 runs on that character. Um, compared to the number of people who play Slay the Spire in total. And... Within those people who say, I'm going to play 50 runs on a character, uh, uh, the number of runs that people play changes. Whether people will repeat a character over and over again changes. Which character they are playing changes. Whether they care about the last 50 runs or the last 100 changes. Whether they care about the 100 before that or not changes. So there isn't really still any defined competitive method for win rate competitions in Slay the Spire, uh, even within what he is doing. He has suggested an, a hyper, hyper specific way to compete about win rate, which was to play one character 50 times and see what your win rate was. But then he will do things like having done that play another 50 times on the character. Or he will play 100 times instead of 50, changing how many times you are meant to play. So even within his own behavior, there isn't a competitive, normalized way to do it in the way that win streaks are normalized, where it's like, you have to win 10 times in a row to win 10 times in a row. Um, which interestingly, he warped that as well at some point, which I, I will mention in passing later. Okay, but that's that's his false dichotomy. Cool. Right. And at that point, I also have a personal opinion on that, right? Because I'm, I'm, I'm very invested in win rates and I, I try to prove a point here, right? And uh, having somebody who's kind of trying to un invalidate this point, is just like super annoying. Like somebody running around and spreading misinformation while I'm trying to actually spread information, educate on this topic. Oh, okay. So talking back to ego defense and self-idealization as a, as a reason that people dehumanize others in strategy gaming, I feel like this is a really good example of it. I don't know if that's exactly why Adrian is doing it here, but it just kind of stood out to me as like, oh yeah, that's exactly the sort of point someone would try to say. So Adrian is trying to say, I'm trying to prove a point here. He's trying to prove a point about win rates and them being a good way to play Slay the Spire. They're important. They're more important than win streaks, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I don't actually entirely know what he's trying to 
prove um exactly um the entire thing has always seemed a little incoherent to me like i was just saying there's like not a consistent way to do it and stuff i'm not entirely sure what it's meant to all mean um and then he will like talk about other people's win rates but those other people didn't play 50 runs in a row of the same character and so it's like wh what how did you get the other person's win rate and how are you comparing the two and it's always been kind of bizarre to me but anyway he's trying to prove some sort of point i'm not entirely sure what it is and having someone who is kind of trying to invalidate this point is just super annoying that is such a self-idealization ego defense thing to say um usually in my experience if i try to proof a point and somebody else tries to invalidate the point that's like normal human interaction i might call that debate i might you know you could call that an argument but it doesn't necessarily have to be mean-spirited this is just like exchange of ideas between two people and in a situation like that maybe i am right maybe i'm wrong i'm generally open to them convincing me that their point of view is correct but i you know i'm allowed to go to bat for my point of view <laughs> if it's not meant to be irritating to them that I'm doing it, right? This is a normal thing in a community where everybody's respected. It's like exchanging ideas. This is just like a normal way that humans interact, I think. Um, but if you're in ego defense and self-idealization mode, when you have a project, like you want to prove that this thing is true, um, and that's your starting point, um, well, then somebody else having their own opinion becomes a threat to you instead of becoming like being just like, oh, yeah, they're a human. They have a different opinion from me. They have different life experience, different priorities, et cetera, et cetera. That's fine. <laughs> That's something humans are like. Um, so that first two clauses is like, oh, wow, ego defense self-idealization. Sure. Yes. Um, and then he he also goes further and and frames me thinking a different thing from him as someone running around spreading misinformation while he's trying to spread information and he's trying to educate on the topic um but okay so i'll read my bullet here adrian is framing someone disagreeing with him as them spreading misinformation again minimizing the idea that he might just be wrong about the point he's trying to make right uh maybe somebody else just disagrees with you for valid reasons um, there were other people who had played 3,000 or more hours of the game when he started streaming the game. And he is saying that he came into the community and like had a personal project to tell everyone it was right to care about something that we didn't care that much about. So it's tremendously like not surprising <laughs> that some of the people who had been playing the game for 3,000 hours and already loved it for something else were like no actually we really like something else about the game we we don't agree with you <laughs> that's kind of normal um someone running around and spreading misinformation by the way like i ha i have taken graduate level statistics courses and a lot of the stuff that i do th it relates to what adrian is doing here is he will make a bunch of claims that are just absolute garbage and i'll be like let's talk about statistics and what certain numbers mean and whether they support hypotheses or not and how it's appropriate to gather data and how it is inappropriate to gather data. So, I mean, I think that this is like clearly a very biased way of framing the conversation that is going on. Uh, it's a very dysfunctional conversation, obviously, but it's, it's very unfair to say that I'm spreading misinformation when I am making slideshows about statistics. Um, my last slideshow I made about statistics led to me being invited by a like high school statistics teacher to give a lecture to their class um, because somebody who teaches statistics was like, oh, you're really good at presenting statistics in a way that's understandable to students. I would like you to be a guest lecturer for my class. So, so that has not been my experience or i think the experience of a lot of other people who have listened to what i've said uh, of what i'm doing 
there. You know, it's just like super annoying. So for those who were wondering, they are also my, you know, sometimes I have some trash talk there or whatever. And just like to for those who don't know uh, why I actually have that opinion, right? Um, it's that. Yeah. And that doesn't even include all the other stuff you hate of him. Yeah. Also all this like whatever backseat blah blah or um, this this other um, that he is like you know arrogant or whatever and doesn't take people serious or like um, uh, makes fun of them in a sarcastic and also toxic way. I'm not even talking about all of those things. Like where my personal stake is included. So I call this begging defamation. Um, that doesn't even include all the other stuff that you hate about him, followed by a bunch of things said without any support. Right. Um, so here, Adrian is just generally suggesting that there exist a bunch of negative things about me, but he doesn't actually explain like what they are. Like he kind of names them, but doesn't delve into them in any way to justify them or explain them. Um, he doesn't support that they really exist. He, he doesn't like actually provide evidence of that. Uh, and he doesn't examine in any way whether they're bad. He just presents them as given bad things. Um, so I genuinely rubbed a lot of people in the Slay the Spire the wrong way in early 2020 by um, changing my channel rules to not allow backseating anymore. And the reason I did that was that I was having anxiety attacks at work from people backseating me so much. I stream because I want to connect with my viewers. And instead I was going to act for shops and it was just like 50 lines of somebody sending a one word sentence suggesting what I should do. I don't think it's likely that anybody else streaming Slay the Spire has ever been in a situation of having as much backseating in their channel as I was at the time that I changed the channel rules to not allow backseating. So when other people who stream Slay the Spire talk about backseating and how like they like it and my rule to not allow it means that like I'm a bad person or something, I feel like that's just a tremendous failure of empathy and like a misunderstanding of what it was like to have your channel blow up in the Slay the Spire community in 2020. I want to, can I do this? Can I give you context? Um, because I don't think that a person who had actually experienced what I experienced, uh, as that Slay the Spire streamer would be like, oh, it's unreasonable to not allow backseating in your channel anymore. I, I think that if they had actually experienced it, they would have thought, oh, gee, that's way too much. Um, so... In 2019, the year before I stopped lying back seating on my channel, this is what Slay the Spire viewership looked like. Uh, I had 1.7 million hours of watch time in Slay the Spire, and the next most viewed Slay the Spire channel on Twitch had a little under 600,000 hours of view time. That was Dolphin Ken's channel. Okay, so my channel was a very, very, very... <laughs> large part of the Spire scene on Twitch. And because of that, it got a lot of traffic from a lot of people, and they said a lot of things, and I had to like make rules and then start enforcing the rules eventually because I was starting to have anxiety attacks from there being so many people. Um, and so what I'm trying to say in a long-winded way is um, I like banned a decent number of people from my channel who felt entitled to behave in my channel in ways that were against my channel rules and stuff like that. And when I hear Adrian say this doesn't even include all the other stuff you hate about him, it's really hard for me not to think that he has welcomed like people I banned from my channel into his channel <laughs> and um catered to them in a way that I was unable to while I had a much more viewership than he did at the time and kind of like is feeding into the things that they don't like about me and that's why they don't like my channel because if I have 1.7 million hours of watch time in a year that is going to result in some people not liking me that is just 
it's just kind of impossible for it not to, unfortunately. I don't know. Are there any people who dislike Bob Ross? Maybe if I were Bob Ross, it would be possible. It's possible. I, I don't really know. Maybe. It's just about this win rate and skill measurement thing where kind of my, um, my effort is being basically um, dumped down by misinformation. That's kind of where I have my stocks in. Yeah, that's why, why I actually disagree with his views and stuff like this. All right. So now, like, Adrian has really, like, toned it down. I feel like his tone changes a lot as he is speaking in, in this, like, sentence or paragraph, maybe. Um, he's trying to be personable and explain his stance here. And he's saying, like, yeah, he trash talks me, but it's not about all the other things which he will nevertheless list um, as negative characterizations of me in front of his audience without any evidence. Um, it's not about those without any evidence or further thought or attempted understanding. Rather, he's trash talking me because of this thing where he really wanted win rates to be a big deal, and I didn't like that. That's why he's actually trash talking me. Um, and I'm calling this justifying bullying. I think that once somebody is manipulative, they will very commonly justify the way that they are behaving. And they'll justify the way that they're behaving externally. They'll say, like, you make me so mad with that behavior as an explanation of why they are yelling at someone uh, or something like that. At this point, Adrian has spoken extremely negative about me for five minutes in front of a live audience of hundreds of people. Uh, he has presented himself as an authority on my life and motivations. He's created a false dilemma to explain my motivations without real examination. He's openly lied several times. Uh, and now, in a much more civil and down-to-earth tone, he's explaining that he does that because I don't think measuring overall win rate and slay the spire is something everyone in the community should feel obliged to do. Um, he's using an online platform to bully me, yes, but he's a reasonable bully. See? Um, yeah. This kind of stuff is extremely exhausting to respond to. This is not like the only time that Adrian has just talked about me on his stream in extremely negative ways for an extremely long time. And this is also not something that he does as a long form bit <laughs> um, regularly. It's also just like short snippets constantly. When he gets a new record on a character, members of his chat will joke about how like that proves that he's better than me. Uh, I did a control F for my name in his chat over the last couple of months, about a month ago. And almost every message about me was negative. Uh, there were viewers there who were like, oh, I like watching Jorbs' video. You should check this one out. And then his chatters would make fun of them for watching me. Um, I was generally like spoken about extremely dismissively and negatively by his community. He has created a, an environment in which there's just normalized bullying of me. Uh, and he's saying that it's justified. So, we change topics now a little bit because even though Adrian says that the only stakes he has in this are that I don't think win rate is important as he does, he is not above talking about me negatively about other things as well. Um, okay. So, um... No, I, I'm just saying because like I'm I'm getting a little bit triggered also because so long I mean that kind of is like the 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 arch right that that so long is also like ah oh, look at this win streaks you know and that's exactly the misinformation yeah also this is halt irgendwie schon ein bisschen bescheuert halt yeah this misinformation thing I don't like it yeah. mm. I feel like we've already covered how that's all like what well, Amok says jobs apparently used to be a poker pro before heads up for roles. This is the next thing. Okay, you know, there has been heads up play, uh, uh, Hearthstone players, and there also have been other Hearthstone players. And now, do you put them into the same, the same bucket? I hope not, because only because somebody played Hearthstone doesn't mean he played Hearthstone. <laughs> I played poker. I did cash in enough. Um, I told you which kind of stakes I played, and then you can make a comparison. Okay, so now we're talking about my poker career. Which is, uh, Adrian and I 
uh, both stopped playing poker over 10 years ago uh, at the time of him recording this. I had a successful poker career. I dropped out of college and supported myself through my 20s off of poker earnings. I was very successful. Um, at one time, I considered myself in the top 100 no limit hold'em players in the world. I spent two bitcoins to buy a membership for one of the first online poker solvers, which could solve hands from the turn onward. I have appeared on some poker podcasts like The Grid with Jennifer Shahade. I have a bunch of friends from my poker playing days. Uh, I, I was a poker player as a career for four years. Um, and here Adrian is suggesting basically that I wasn't. <laughs> Um, not based on anything, right? He's just saying, well, not everyone who says they're a poker player is a poker player. Um, I was, uh, but but he's just kind of like immediately challenging the idea that I was. Um, and he's also suggesting that he's better than me, despite neither of us having played for ten plus years. Uh, based on no evidence other than what his prejudice of me as a player is. I guess maybe also based on like his own results as a poker player. That is perhaps also a thing that he's judging that off of. So, I mean, ultimately, you know, poker is as one measurement of poker because it, like every everything surrounds um, cash in poker. That's the poker world, yeah? It's a lot about money, all right? And... You can just take a look like i mean i don't know whether he's sharing his wins or whatever right or whether he ever talked about it but i'm very certain that it's not anywhere close in this area of what what uh, i could reap from that um area yeah maybe that sounds a little bit arrogant but i really mean it i mean that's a measurement as you, as well as you can measure win rates in slate fire in poker you measure the money that's a measurement in poker all right I'm very confident that it's nowhere close to what I could reap from that area. As well as you can measure win rates in Slay the Spire, in poker, you measure the money. This is goalpost shifting. Someone said, George was a professional poker player too. What if you two played heads up? That's what was said. And Adrian has responded by saying, well, he wasn't really a poker player. Like, was he really a poker player? Like, some people play Hearthstone, but they're not Hearthstone players um, kind of thing. Note that there I was actually impersonating Adrian. <laughs> I was actually saying the words that he said. Um, that's funny to me. Um, all right. Um, but, but then he's moved on from that. Now he's talking about like who was better at poker, which wasn't really what got brought up. What got brought up was like we could do a heads up challenge for poker to settle this grudge that he seems to have with me, right? Someone suggested one way that we could compete um, to, I don't know, be interesting to viewers and settle this feud or whatever that we have. Um, and, and he's saying also, after saying, am I really a poker player? He's saying that he's confident that he can win, that he could win, I think, past tense, more money playing poker than I did, which is kind of consistent with his highly particular opinion of Slay the Spire, insofar as he highly particularly thinks that the way to tell who's good at Slay the Spire is like the win rate of different Slay the Spire players. But it's really bizarre for me to hear him say that as a poker player myself, an ex-poker player, we'll say. Um, I haven't played poker seriously in 10 plus years. I wouldn't say that I'm a good poker player anymore, for what it's worth. Um, but anyway... Um, nobody I ever spoke with about poker was under the impression that having made tons of money playing poker meant you were good at poker. And in fact, kind of the opposite, lots of us thought that many people who had made tons from the game were desirable opponents at our tables. And I would say that that was especially true if they made that money 10 plus years ago and still thought that they were better than everybody else, right? Um, there is some sort of correlation between being good at player and making, being good at poker and making lots of money at poker. But it isn't fully causal, and it isn't necessarily long-lasting. Um, and I also want to say, I think this is the first time that we get into internal inconsistencies. 
If someone is warping reality and making reality something other than what it is, they're basically lying, right? And if you tell lots and lots and lots of small lies, which is what's happening here, like kind of every sentence has a small lie in it. Um, maybe it's not a full lie, maybe it's kind of like a misframing, or maybe the sentiment is a little bit negative, more negative than it ought to be. So maybe you wouldn't call it an exactly a lie, but we're slowly changing reality over and over and over and over again. But if somebody does that, you end up with inconsistencies that you're noticing in how they present reality over the course of time. They make statements which are internally inconsistent with other things that they've said. So for example, if you look Adrian up and try to find out about his poker experience, which is something that I did after I saw him doing this, I was like, oh, you're really good at poker. I am curious what that means. You will find him saying that he felt like he was selling years of his life as a slave and that he considered the way he played to be unethical now. Um, Here's a clip of his, um, this is Life Coach, Life Lessons, Poker Story, and Financial Independence. Um, just saying, nowadays I don't think that. Nowadays I think it's unethical. But back then, I... So, it's really weird that there he is saying that about poker. He's, he's describing one of the ways that he played poker to make as much money as possible, basically. Um, and saying that nowadays... He wouldn't have done that. He thinks that that was unethical. But then here he is talking about me, and he's saying, well, I could make more money than him. Uh, that's the measurement of whether you're good at poker or not. So I'm pretty comfortable saying that I'm the better poker player, which is really hard to reconcile. Um, I could have made more money playing poker if I didn't care about ethics at all, uh, 100%. In fact, I stopped playing poker largely because it was frustrating to me that being deceptive and kind of skirting the rules of sites um, was the way to make the most money, and that wasn't something that I was interested in doing. And, and funnily enough, Adrian expresses the same frustration about poker um, in his video. <laughs> he says that he didn't like like, he says that he played on lots and lots of different accounts because deceiving the other players was so valuable, and he thought it was silly that you had to do that. So, I don't know. I, I don't feel like this is a thorough and good faith examination of whether I'm a poker player and what makes a good poker player by Adrian, which isn't surprising because I don't feel like it's a thorough and good faith examination of anything about me, really. I just feel like he's saying a bunch of stuff. Yeah, so... Ja, also, naja, egal. Na gut, na gut. Ja. Because that's also what I heard very often. I also heard it all the time. Oh, but he was also ex-poker player. And I'm like, yeah, okay, yeah. I mean, <laughs> who didn't play poker at that time, guys? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Who didn't play poker at that time? I keep on hearing over and over again that Jorbs was an ex-poker player. So, who didn't play poker at that time? The vast majority of people didn't play poker at that time. Um, when he's talking about his poker career, for much of his poker career, I was not legally allowed to play poker. Uh, I was under 21 in the United States. So I wasn't playing poker for most of the time that he was. Uh, a decent chunk of the avenues that he used to make money in poker that he talks about in his Life Lessons poker story um, just like weren't actually open to me anymore when I started playing poker, um, which is whatever. I'm not interested in comparing myself to Adrian at poker either, just like I wasn't trying to compare myself to him at Slay the Spire. I'm just trying again to examine how he talks about me for like 20 minutes here and every single sentence he says is manipulative. <laughs> That's again still what I'm trying to do. So who didn't play poker at that time, guys? Like most people didn't play poker at that time. Um, it's very rare to have made money playing poker in your life. Not many people have done that, and most people were not doing that in 2008. Most people who play poker lose money. Um, but I think more importantly in this little segment, in this little sentence, he expresses that multiple people have told him, like he's repeatedly being told by lots of other people that I'm an ex-poker player. 
presumably you would think that those people were like acting in good faith that they knew this about me and they were communicating that information to him um but he's stating that he just kind of like doesn't believe them basically like that they're wrong he's he's just saying like who didn't play poker at that time you can play hearthstone or you can actually play hearthstone and like jorbs is not a person who actually played poker um but he's not basing that on anything it's just based on nothing he's made some sort of claim to be an authority about me and is speaking confidently about my life but at this point he's actually self-admittedly speaking about a part of my life that he doesn't know anything about as though he's an authority about it um and he hasn't really made that clear to his audience i don't think he hasn't framed this as like I don't know. Maybe he has. Who could say? He, his intent here is to present me as like not being super successful. Uh, and that's the way that he's trying to say things. That's it's what it seems like. It's always a question on how you did play it, right? Okay. Um... So he talks about some other stuff for a little bit here. So I'm going to skip ahead um, because he goes and talks about other things about his stream. And then we rejoin... Let me not actually talk about me for 20 minutes because there is an eight minute gap here, I guess. But then a viewer asks him another question about me or says something else about me. I said it was 20, 40, 40, but apparently I was wrong. There is so much dead time in streaming, isn't there? Gosh. Hello? Also getting too deep into this. But Wallabies says nowadays shops openly talks about how good sword rotating win rate is. Yeah, let's let's keep it the last shops comment, but um because I think we are also getting too deep into nowadays, this. Nowadays George but, uh, you're openly. saying Somebody says nowadays Jorbs openly talks about how good his rotating win rate is. Do I? Did I? I find that so weird. One of the one of the things that I felt was an accurate characterization of me around about this time was somebody talking about competition in Slay the Spire and saying like it's like pulling teeth to get Jorbs to tell you what his win rate is. Like I wasn't making my runs available, I wasn't publicizing my win rate from my runs, and I generally wouldn't say what it was on my stream when somebody asked me what it was i would say jokes like that it was 69 percent, and that uh, if i kept on improving at this rate it would soon be 420 percent. like i very very deliberately moved away from talking about my win rate because um adrian's viewers were constantly challenging my win rate and trying to compare us over win rate because that was what he was trying to do and this is like a single player strategy game which i wasn't playing to compete with somebody who was a pernicious manipulator <laughs> so i didn't want to engage with that um but yeah um okay so anyway apparently somebody else says that i did that i don't know why but adrian's into it uh why don't you try uh, and enter the arena that you what blah 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 also um about the rotating now look we've already done that you know Oh, I missed it, actually. Shoot. Okay, I'll try to go back. Whatever. I wouldn't make my decision upon that, but I'm just saying... Um, yeah, I mean, there will be people who are very interested in that and will... Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Now, yeah, in Poker Quest, it's rather about some lines are raised by, I mean, of course, from people and professional trolls. All right, here we go. It was a 24-40-40. I must have gone ah, to the wrong time set. I'm sorry. Big streamers get the chat they deserve. Lots of live code chat is full of informed people. I'm sorry. I'm such a bad content creator. Anyway, here's the clip I was trying to show you. <laughs> huh? 
Ah, Beth Hurst says, big streamers get the chat they deserve. Also, Life Coach Chat is full of informed people and professional trolls. And Job Chat is full of the same two jokes over and over and a bunch of deleted comments. Yeah, I am no no kidding, man. Yeah, it's just like so. Yeah. But it's it's very, like what you say, it's like so positive. I, I really like it. I mean, having a readable chat is... And that you can have, like, interaction. It's also, like, for me, you know, I'm learning from my chat too. It's, like, great, you know. I love it. Instead of, like, thinking just, like, as my chat being only low lives and, like, making fun of them all the time. It's quite the difference. Yeah. Okay. So here a viewer says big streamers get the chat they deserve. Lots of life coach viewers are trolls. Uh, or, uh, I don't remember exactly what they said about life coaches viewers, whatever. And George's chat is full of the same two jokes over and over and a bunch of deleted comments. And life coach like gets into it. He's like, yeah, absolutely. And then he's like, you know, it's kind of like pointed things. Like he likes having a chat that's readable. Uh, he's learning from his chat all the time. Uh, which feel a little bit, at least in the context of everything else he's saying, like deliberately trying to contrast his chat with his belief about what mine is like. I don't know. Uh, my chat got out of hand because I was, again, a tremendously, tremendously, tremendously popular Slay the Spire content creator. Um, if you look for Life Coach on this list, he, I guess, wasn't streaming Slay the Spire at all. Um, and if we go to the next year, um, Life Coach did start streaming Slay the Spire in 2020. But if you look at it, he streamed um, he streamed like more than twice my hours and got less watch time than me. I had three times the number of viewers that he had. So when he's like talking about liking his chat and liking it being readable and stuff, and when people are saying like big streamers get the chat they deserve and stuff like that, um, we're not comparing like with like here. Let me see what 2021 is because maybe I'm being unfair. Maybe his channel was having like significantly higher average viewership in 2021. Um... In 2021, I averaged 2.5k viewers and had um, 3.1 million hours watch time, and he averaged 879. So no, <laughs> um, we're not comparing like with like. So when he's talking about like his chat being readable and like big streamers get the chat they deserve and stuff, like he's talking about me being like on full blast from the YouTube algorithm, getting like all sorts of completely new Slay the Spire viewers tons and tons and tons of new people coming into my, my community, me having anxiety attacks because there are so many people watching, me trying to enforce channel rules and having people yell at me and harass me, all at the same time while Adrian is on his channel, which is now the third most watched Slay the Spire channel, just running lengthy segments like this to, like, if he averages 800 viewers, that means when he's actually fully streaming, he's, like, probably streaming to 1 to 1.2k viewers. So while I am, like, the person with the most Slay the Spire viewers, he is just like openly harassing me for 20 minutes on his channel and then his viewers are going to take his version of reality and bring it to me and talk about me and social media that way. Um, uh, so it's not a very fair comparison at all. For what it's worth, I really love my community. I really love streaming. It's really weird to me to hear someone suggest that I don't, because if I hated streaming, I just wouldn't do it, right? Surely. Um, but that's what he's he's trying to do here. So uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, I think the manipulators love to get other people involved in reinforcing their vision of reality. So I think that when you're being manipulative about someone and you're saying reality is this way, reality is this way, this is what reality is, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then someone else comes along and is like, yeah, and decides to reinforce that and, like, agrees with you. Uh, like, yeah, it's unsurprising to me that he would roll with that 100%. And he does, like, roll with it. He improvises a little bit here and starts talking about the nature of the chat of my channel, which, like, to my knowledge, like, he's never sent a message in my channel and doesn't watch my channel, so I don't know why he thinks he knows what it's like, really. But he thinks he does. Um, so cool. 
Um, I think it's important to note here that Adrian is making up a version of my community here. And a bunch of the deleted comments from my channel that we're talking about, um, for what it's worth also, because like insofar as same two jokes over and over and a bunch of deleted comments is somewhat of a reality coherent um, criticism of my channel insofar as I stopped allowing backseating during this year. And like, yes, my community has in jokes, obviously. I, I think that saying that my channel has the same two jokes over and over is kind of like observing that Adrian's channel insults other people in the community over and over. Like, okay, we both have channel cultures. Sure, that was me. Kind of framing things manipulatively back, you see. Although I think that I adhere to reality a lot better than he does. Um, one of the cool things about strategy gaming and being a strategy gamer is that when people are very manipulative toward you, you're like, well, I can see how I could manipulate them back. Um, and, you know, choosing to be a good person requires that you don't do that for the most part. Um, it was a really heated conversation that I had. Oh, it wasn't so heated. Maybe that's the wrong word. Uh, when my friend was getting abused in a relationship by this other friend of mine, the other friend worked out that I knew and then like kind of made a big deal about it. And then was, there was a day where my friend blocked him and like on every messaging service, my friend regularly did this to try to get him to leave them alone. And he came to me to say like, hey, our friend blocked me. Do you know what's going on? Just by the way, like we're dating. Uh, I'm worried about them. They're, they're doing something with cryptocurrency or something like that. You should really let me, um, you know, check in on them and tell them they should talk to me again and stuff like that. What had happened was that my friend had gotten into an online cryptocurrency game, which they were enjoying a lot. And then their abuser had called them an idiot and told them that they shouldn't do that and that they were dumb and stuff like that. And so they had blocked him again. <laughs> um, but I had this conversation with him. This was the first time I'd ever had a conversation with him knowing that he was abusing my friend. And it was really fascinating to have that context to our conversation because he was trying to manipulate me in that circumstance. The conversation was about this relationship within which he was manipulative. And knowing that he was trying to manipulate me, I could like see goalposts changing and see reframings of reality happening and see him trying to get something from me. And then when it became apparent that he wasn't going to get it, him changing what he was trying to get and pretending like he hadn't actually wanted that in the first place and stuff like this. And something that was kind of like powerful as a strategy gamer myself was feeling like there were times where I could be a bit manipulative back to him, where he would say, like, our friend shouldn't be playing this pay-to-win cryptocurrency game, and I would say back, they are an adult, they can choose what to do um, with their own agency, and, like, I'm being manipulative back, but, like, kind of for the forces of good. Because <laughs> I'm, like, reasserting what reality actually is. I'm using the thing that we're talking about to come back to, like, no, actually, real reality here. We're talking about an adult who is different from you, who currently has you blocked in all messaging services. You don't get to say what they do. <laughs> um, as a comment on his behavior more generally. Um, so anyway, yes. Um, <laughs> it's hard to like watch all of this and not be a little bit frustrated and get a little bit, <laughs> you know. Um, but also a, a note that I had about this thing where we're being extremely critical of my channel and my chat and stuff like that and suggesting that I think that my chat is a bunch of lowlifes and making fun of them all the time, which just like... I can see how that interpretation of my relationship with my chat kind of connects a little bit to reality, but the actual way that I would frame my relationship with my chat is that we joke about like chat being a hive mind that just isn't that great at Slay the Spire, and it's like consensual joking. <laughs> like when we do chat runs where chat gets to choose the cards, they all really want to 
pick Claw and then they make arguments about how Claw is the best card, or when we get the boot, they're all talking about how the boot is the best relic, and that isn't because like they actually think the boot is the best relic, nor is it because they are lowlifes, nor is me talking about how the boot isn't actually the best relic, me making fun of my chat. That's just like an in-joke in my community. Um, but anyway, you can see how that reality of what my community is actually like could be misinterpreted and negatively framed in this different way, um, which is, you know, the beginnings of this sort of manipulation. We're just manipulating everything about me in a more and more negative light over and over and over again. Um, but the thing that I wanted to say about all of this is a lot of the deleted comments in my channel are from Adrian's viewers <laughs> um, because my channel has a bunch of viewers and his channel also has quite a lot of viewers and he's saying stuff like this about me all the time on his channel. Um, maybe not all the time, but frequently enough that it is characteristic of his channel and normalized on his channel to speak about me in this way. Um, viewers come into my channel from his channel to harass me. <laughs> so quite a lot of the deleted comments are from his viewers. And the reason I stopped discussing strategy as a whole on my channel wasn't that I had tons of viewers backseating me. That's why I stopped allowing backseating. But the reason that I stopped discussing strategy as a whole was that I found that whenever I talked about strategy, like this is how I think that you should play Slay the Spire types of comments, I got the thing where he opened that Reddit post that I showed you earlier and like was extremely negative toward me and talked about how I was arrogant and stuff. I would get that from him if I did that. And it just wasn't worth my time. It wasn't worth my time to receive that sort of harassment, et cetera, et cetera. So I largely stopped talking about strategy, and that's largely why my channel doesn't have that sort of communication on it anymore. It's directly because of him. Um, I will say I had the agency to make that choice. Perhaps I could have stuck through it, but it became incredibly unpleasant for me to continue talking about strategy on my channel because I was getting harassed by people who wanted to talk about him all the time, despite it being inappropriate, despite my channel rules saying don't bring up other streamers, despite me muting his name on my channel chat because so many people would bring him up to harass me, people would still ask me about him just constantly, nonstop, all the time. And so I largely moved away from talking about strategy and Slay the Spire. Um, so I'm not really like trying to blame him for me not doing that as much. That was my choice. But it is really frustrating to me for someone to criticize me for not doing that, to say that he is better than me, like his chat is better than mine, when he is deliberately creating an extremely toxic environment toward people who have a different opinion about the game from him. And we've already seen how he frames that earlier here, where he was talking about how his opinion of how the game was his personal project he was trying to prove was right and when other people had a different opinion that was really irritating to him and they were spreading misinformation right and that's what talking about strategy has been like in the slay the spire community since he started doing that for me all right um now we scrub for blah, blah 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 also um about the rotating now yeah, look we've already done that you know i mean so somebody asked um, you know, Jorbs plays rotating. Why don't you play rotating if you want to compete with Jorbs? Which is kind of a reasonable question, you would think, right? We know that on the Ironclad we play whatever, 70-75% Masi Manos. That's clear, right? And on the silent we did like a very large sample. I mean large sample, I think 150 games or something, 64%, right? We are probably better than that nowadays, but let's make it let's keep it 64. With the defect, we have done the same for 56, and with the watcher, we are probably around 90% plus, right? And you do not need you do not need a rotating sample for that. I mean, everybody else who can add two plus two together—that's four, by the way. Um okay, I'm gonna stop there because that was him being like just really negative, and feels like the right tone to stop on for a second. So here he is, like just like committing logical fallacies and extrapolation to try to present himself in a really good light, which is like a flip side of presenting other people in a negative light. You also present yourself in a good light, right? 
And he's constructed a 72% rotating win rate for himself based on averaging single character win rates. That's what he's just done. But like, I think most reasonable people understand that playing lots of characters in a game is harder than playing one character. But manipulators are happy to ignore all sorts of things about reality in order to construct whatever reality is favorable to them. So he doesn't think like, well, yeah, it could be actually hard to play all four characters at the same time. When I do my win rates for the characters, what I do is I play, you know, I practice them for quite a while, and then I will play 50 runs just of that character with like extreme focus. And sometimes I don't get the result that I'm looking for, and so I will do it again. And, you know, sometimes I will spend multiple months just playing one character in order to prove the win rate that I'm going to tell you that I have. Um, I could see, perhaps, that it could be difficult to instead be trying to be good at all four characters at the same time. He doesn't say that. He dismisses the very idea. He then uses arithmetic to say that he has a 72% rotating win rate despite never having played the game rotating. He's just never done that, and now he's invented that for himself. Um, just adds these percentages and divides them by four. Yeah, And if you do that, you will get 170 plus 120, 290 divided by four, 72%. Yeah? And that is probably also most likely our rotating win rate, 72%. Um, I assume last time I checked, I mean, I, I think I know I just wanted to pause that. That is such a massive... You could do a lesson of a statistics class about how bad that was. Um, something that really stresses me out about that, as someone who cares about statistics, is that there's no expression of uncertainty. So he played some amount of runs on like Ironclad and got a certain win rate. That doesn't mean that that is his win rate for a variety of reasons. One being that he played those runs like however long ago. So now he hasn't played Ironclad for however long. Uh, actually, in this case, he just played 50 runs of Ironclad. So that's a bad example, but like we'll say for Silent instead of Ironclad. Um, that's one reason. But another reason is that there is variance in 50 runs of Slay the Spire. And so if you got a result in 50 runs, you would say like, I have 80% like plus or minus 5% based on my sample size, right? And you can't just arithmetic four different samples like that, add them together, and then average them, uh, and then still not have any expression of uncertainty. It is not most likely that his win rate rotating was 72%, even if it were possible to play the same on Ironclad Silent Defect and Watcher as he had been when he was focusing on them individually. It is far more likely that some amount of variance existed um, than that his win rate is actually 72%. Um, another thing that he's done in terms of expressions of uncertainty is I've seen him present his win rates as a lower bound of his win rate, which is also really weird. So he'll say that his win rate with Watcher is 90% plus. Instead of saying that it is perhaps 91% plus or minus 3, which is really fascinating because, like, Anybody who has ever seen statistics anywhere, I feel like, knows that that's not how you express uncertainty around statistical numbers, but it is so succinctly how you would frame statistical numbers to try to make yourself look as good as possible by saying it's impossible that it's below 80 or below 90, which just isn't really like true. Um, and also by creating a lower bound like, is it 99%? Well, your expression of uncertainty didn't say that it wasn't. Um, anyway, his statistics stress me out as somebody who has studied statistics. Um, yeah. Oh, more, more. Where you're coming from, because he kind of high rolled in the last, last time he did like the I spam as many games or whatever, like this super challenges where he counts his wins. And I think he was like around 65% rotating in this, uh, in this uh, sample. I mean, that was a high roll. I'm also very certain of it. We will see. Maybe he does another rotating sample again. But uh, a lot of data points speak for a massive high roll there. All right. All right. So now he is trying to do statistics on my games. And I want to talk about ways in which he's framing this incorrectly. Um, OK, so first of all, he's misrepresenting a volume challenge 
as me playing to maximize win rate, right? And he says that out loud in his analysis. He kind of high rolled in the last time he did the I spam as many games, uh, these super challenges where he counts his wins. He says that that's what I'm doing. He says that that is the thing that I am doing. He says that that's reality. And then he immediately analyzes that as though it's a correct representation of my win rate. Like, like the best win rate I could achieve. He has very clearly stated that I'm not trying to maximize my win rate. He's very clearly stated that I'm trying to maximize the number of wins I can get. I'm spanning as many games. It's a super challenge. These are volume challenges that I would do where I would try to get 100 plus wins in a month. And I was very, very clearly to anybody who was watching not trying to play at the highest level I possibly could. Uh, I would regularly buy Prismatic Shard. I would dig on every run. I would play really long hours such that at the end of the stream I was hallucinating and pressing end turn with apparitions in hand and just dying. Like Nobody who watched those was under the impression that that was me playing for the highest win rate I could possibly get. And yet here he is, first expressing that he understands that that's what I'm doing, and then using that to try to analyze my win rate, which is kind of weird. But also within that, he's saying that he thinks there are a lot of data points which speak for a massive high roll with me getting 65% high uh, rotating in that sample, which is weird. Uh, which data points exactly would those be? Because what? <laughs> what data? How? Do, how? What? <laughs> Maybe he's gone through all of the runs and seen that I got Runic Pyramid more often than usual or something. Uh, I, that wasn't my impression, but maybe he has. I don't know. Um, but there's also within this, we talked about internal inconsistency a little bit earlier, right? Remember like quite recently when he said that I had a 40% Ironclad rate and a 48% Watcher run rate and that like those were valid, um, those were genuine win rates. But now he's talking about me having 65% rotating win rate over like over 100 runs. So reality is over, over the course of less than 15 minutes, reality has been torn asunder and we're living in a reality where two completely contrasting things are being presented as true. And then he's trying to minimize both of them. Uh, I also wanted to add for actual reality context, Adrian recently tried playing rotating for the first time and won 63% of his runs, and my ro recent rotating sample, I won 77%. I am still not trying to say that I'm a better Slay the Spire player than Adrian. I just wanted to add some of my own reality to his expression of his reality. At least a high roll. But even if it would not have been a high roll, 65 is considerably worse than 72 in all aspects, you know. So it's pointless, you know. Also, um, I know what you're referring to. Like he's, he's always moving goalposts and also shifting the reality, pinpoint specific samples and then breaks with them. If you ask me personally, I think he's just a freaking loser and a soul. Just a second, we'll get into the name calling. First, I wanted to address the always moving goalposts, etc. Pinpointing specific samples and then bragging with them. Like, what he's describing is me playing Slay the Spire and then sometimes challenging myself to do things. And if I succeed at them, I will like communicate that I've done it in literally any way like the first time that he described me as bragging it was me looking at the results in my run history in my slay the spire game on my own stream for example um but also i will like make a post on reddit and say here i managed 80 percent rotating win rate for a month here's how i did it and made a bunch of strategy advice and got 2.1 thousand upvotes from a lot of people who enjoyed that because i'm a slay the spire creator right so i talk about slay the spire strategy sometimes um um but the thing that's interesting to me about this like moving the goalposts thing, uh, I titled this slide Entitlement to Behavior, which I think is something that manipulators express sometimes. And there's this really interesting interplay between entitlement and arrogance for manipulators. 
If someone feels entitled to you doing something that passes your boundaries for what is acceptable, they run into your boundaries, right? And then you express like, no, I don't want to do that. That isn't in my own interests. I'm not interested in it. I often find that the next step after that is to call you arrogant. So you think that you know better than me. So your perspective is better than mine is what you're trying to say, basically, right? That's like kind of the next step when the entitlement gets rejected. That's a common form of trying to frame someone expressing their boundaries against your own entitlement in a negative way. And I run into that a fair amount as a Twitch streamer when people will break my channel rules and then get timed out. I will then have them tell me that I am arrogant. <laughs> um, which isn't what arrogant means. Um, but yes, that is, that is a thing that happens. Um, but anyway, that aside, um, Adrian isn't entitled to me competing with him in a way that he wants at the game Slay the Spire, which is a single player strategy game with no competitive tournament scene. Um, but he seems to be suggesting that it's appropriate for me to give him some consistent way to compete with me. Like, I have to say, like, the way to be the best player in the world is to do a certain thing, which is really weird <laughs> in the context of, like, he's saying that I care a lot about win streaks. Um, and the way that he's framed that is, no, I used to care about something else. Now I care about wins. Like, if he really wanted to compete with me and, like, that was important to him, and I'm now saying that win streaks are really important, couldn't he just, like, go for win streaks? Right? Um, he's portraying me as this, like, evil, manipulative person who's deliberately um, shifting the goalposts because I used to care about win rates, but then when he did well with win rates, which, again, by the way, wasn't as good as other people were doing with win rates, but he says that he was doing better than other people with win rates. When he did that, um, when he did that, then I started caring about win streaks, um, which are bullshit, even though they are a very normal competitive metric in roguelites and have been since before Slay the Spire existed and have been in the Slay the Spire community for a very long time among a very large number of people. Um, why doesn't he just compete with me on win streaks? If, like, if I'm so evil and he's better than me at Slay the Spire by such a large amount, um, the math is just like he should absolutely smash my win streaks very quickly. Um, and for what it's worth, like, I stepped back from Slay of the Spire a ton, largely because the community was like this, and it was really stressful, and I didn't like it, and I didn't want to compete in Slay of the Spire, and I didn't like my channel being as large as it was. So, in, uh, 2022, I still streamed, like, quite a lot of Slay of the Spire, but... The viewership was a little bit down. Sure, whatever. But I still streamed a thousand hours of Slay the Spire, which I think is like a bit less than I did. Wait, is it more than I did in 2021? I don't know. Anyway, um, Slay the Spire viewership was a little bit down then. And then in 2023, which just ended, I like really, really stepped back from Slay the Spire. I streamed under 500 hours of Slay the Spire in 2023. So I've like really like moved away from playing the game quite a lot and he has continued to improve and continued to really push himself and he does have a lot of win streaks on characters now so like of course he does <laughs> um i'm happy for him and it's a cool achievement like genuinely like i think it's cool when people get win streaks and always have and that's great and i wish that when he got win streaks people didn't come into my channel to insult me um but it's cool that humans are still getting better at Slay the Spire, this game that I love extremely, extremely, extremely heavily. That's great. Um, <laughs> but, but he doesn't do that here. He like won't say that he's going to do that. And it's, it's kind of weird. Um, and also, like, I have competed for world records with other players in the past. So, like, I have done the thing that he's saying I should do. 
I have competed with Terrence and Baylor for the rotating world record. I mean, lots of players, but Terrence, Baylor, and I all set new rotating world records within a two-week period one time, and that was like really awesome when we got on call together and talked about those world records together for like three hours, and that was great. And then Baylor and I both had world records last year. I set 17, he set 20, and that was awesome. And we got on call together and talked about those. So like, there is a competitive scene in Slay the Spire. He could be competing in, but he came into the Slay the Spire community with a personal project to say a different type of competition was the right way to play, like the, the valuable way to play. He has said that out loud. He has said that he dislikes me because I disagreed with him. And so, like, of course nobody's competing with him. Of, of course few people are competing with him. Um, he's chosen to play in a game with no form of competition, and the communally agreed upon form of competition that the people who were playing the game uh, when he came into the game were competing over, uh, he didn't like and has been calling it bullshit. Um, there are no tournaments. It's not a multiplayer game. Other people are not obliged to play with them, and when he treats the other people like he is, why would other people want to play with them? And so when he's talking about moving goalposts and me moving away from the things that he tries to do on his stream, which I think is a thing, truthfully, that is a thing that I've done. For example, when people kept asking about those volume challenges that I did, because um, I would try to kill 100 hearts in a month and people liked watching that, he tried doing that to compete with me and he called it monkey kills and he tried to do way more than me and he streamed like a hundred more hours than I ever had in a month and he got more of those than me and that really made me not want to do it anymore and it wasn't because I didn't want to compete with them it's because now people harassed me while I was doing it because of how he runs his channel right so he's not entitled to me just like just like sitting there to be a punching bag for him to abuse. And I feel like most reasonable people would realize that. But here he's expressing entitlement to my behavior. And I want to make a fairly large deal about that because that's a thing that people who are manipulative do. And if you notice it happening and then get called like arrogant or unreasonable for reinforcing your boundaries, that's also a thing that people who are manipulative do. All right. Anyway. Then we get into ad hoc. And also shifting the reality, pinpoint specific samples and then breaks with them. If you ask me personally, I think he's just a freaking loser and a sore loser as well, right? On top of that. All right. So this is just name calling. Uh, it's really jarring to hear stuff that's like just name calling. Earlier, he said it was possible that I was a fucktard, uh, but, but that there was another option, uh, which was also kind of weird and like mean um but yeah this is just name calling um i have encountered name calling extremely rarely in my adult life it is not something that adults that i know do but here is a guy targeting me with it on stream in front of hundreds of people and having them support him so that's really weird and obviously name calling is not great uh, and if you let people get away with it in your community regularly you're probably not going to end up having a very good community uh, I think Adrian being extremely negative toward other people who play Slay the Spire, because he hasn't just been negative toward me. Um, I am one of the people he has been the most negative toward, maybe the person he has been the most negative toward, but he's been very negative toward other people and other people's way of playing and enjoying the game as well. Um, yeah, I think that has made the Slay the Spire community quite a lot worse. And... I mean, maybe Americans like that. I don't know. He probably has a lot of American viewers. I also have the feeling that it's, for whatever reason, I feel that also like trashing people, talking them down is uh, being more accepted or even a funny thing for uh, the American population. Not in general, but I'm just saying, you know, it feels to me it's rather a thing, um, yeah, how to frame it the best. I mean, apparently that's the thing Americans enjoy to watch yeah because I see I saw that also for like at other streamers um, kind of not a similar behavior also ich glaube so ein Kotzbrocken habe ich noch nie gesehen aber but also such a douchebag I think I mean like from the arrogant way of the thing I think he's pretty much on the top you know <laughs> but um, 
uh, this, honestly. I mean, I don't even have any stakes in that any longer. It's uh, what can I say? Yeah, it's uh, I don't like him. I guess he also doesn't like me. I mean, I've never heard. All right. Um. So he just said a bunch of weird shit about Americans <laughs> for quite a while. Kind of weird. Um, he thinks that I have a larger American audience than he does, I suppose. And so I have to trash talk and be arrogant, which do not describe me accurately. Um, I find this part largely incoherent. One thing that I think is interesting about this, though, is like, the words that he's talking about like all the time, like how do I frame this best? Um, do American viewers like this? Like the, the places that his brain is going. Um, I would never assume that another streamer was trash talking and being arrogant because American viewers liked it. That to me is a really weird thing to think Generally, I assume that streamers are acting somewhat authentically to how they are as a human being, and certainly I cannot imagine somebody deciding to start being arrogant because American viewers liked it. Um, so I mostly found this incoherent, but I thought it was kind of interesting in like a maybe slightly telling on himself kind of way that these are the sorts of thoughts that he's having because... I think it speaks to the sorts of thoughts that he has when deciding on his own behavior a little bit. And um, the stuff about trash talking and arrogance feels like it describes his behavior a lot better than it describes mine. Uh, and hopefully, having watched this, I'm not trying to trash talk him by saying that, and I'm not trying to be arrogant by saying that. I am trying to impartially say what reality is. I, I am trying to observe that this is a clip of him trash talking me for uh 20 minutes and that he comes off as a little bit arrogant in it maybe <laughs> like a, a touch i don't think about that like he's but i assume i mean i <laughs> anything else would surprise me and i mean that's just how things are and yeah so be it <laughs> I mean, yeah as there's nothing more to say to that, honestly. Yeah. Um, but how could we end the Slay the Spire sample without trashing, trash talking jobs, right? I mean, that, that's part of it, guys. That's part of it. That's part of the experience. All right. What a lovely sign off. How could we end a Slay the Spire sample without trash talking jobs? I mean, that's part of it, guys. That's part of it. I really think. And I talked about this with giving the benefit of the doubt. And like, if you listen to someone and they tell you who they are, you have to believe them. I know a lot of people who are extremely kind and sometimes they are just too kind and someone will directly tell them that they are being an asshole and uh, being manipulative sometimes. And they just like, won't believe them. They'll think, no, you're a nice person. You wouldn't do that. Uh, but there has to be some point where you stop extending the benefit of the doubt. And it's wild to me that Adrian is able to just say on his channel live to hundreds of people that he is trash talking me. He literally just like last sentence, literally just last sentence talked about how I trash talked lots of people. And that was what I was like as a negative thing. And then he turns around and like the next sentence says that a normal part of his community is every time they play a Slay the Spire sample, they trash talk me. Uh, and that is part of his, like, flagship content on his channel. Um, so breathtaking. Breathtaking. Um, manipulators, I think, love seeing their version of reality accepted and applauded. And here Adrian signs off with a blunt admission that he has repeatedly incorporated trash-talking me into his content. And beyond any measure or commentary on personal conduct, uh, this is harassment. This is against Twitch community guidelines. You're not allowed to repeatedly trash talk people on your channel. That's not a thing that you're meant to use Twitch channels for. So yeah, I don't know. Uh, it would be cool if it stopped, <laughs> but um, 
going after a person who is a multimillionaire, huge content creator, uh, established face on Twitch and expecting them to stop manipulating is like, that's going to be hard to do. I don't expect to succeed at that really. Uh, I would be humbled if people stood up for me sometimes when stuff like this was happening. It would be lovely. Um, but the guy, like, I was able to pause after almost every sentence or paragraph that he said to point out a way that he was manipulating reality for 20 minutes, throughout which, oh, minus eight minutes, I guess it's only 12 minutes. Um, throughout which he was just extremely, extremely, extremely negative about me pretty much nonstop uh, while trying to present himself as, like, a pretty chill dude, um, and I was the arrogant one. So that's like my experience with Adrian's content. And this is not the only time that he's done something like this to me. It has in fact been very normal. Um, this was recorded over a year and a half. Over a year, I think. Hold on. Okay, this was recorded. Shoot, I don't know where the tweet went. This was recorded significantly after I um, blocked him on Twitch, muted his name from my channel, and stopped talking about him in front of my community because the first way that I responded to this sort of manipulation as a content creator was to try to remove myself from it. So I moved away from what he was doing. I tried to stop playing the game in a way that resembled how he was playing it at all. Then I started to stop caring about results at all. I started to stop to stop talking about strategy in general about the game. Then I stopped playing the game as much, um, and he just still does it. Uh, if you look in the chat in his channel, there are still people trash talking me. If I stream, I still get messages from people who are coming from his channel to harass me. So it just still happens. Um, so as a content creator, I don't know how easily I can extract myself from this situation. I really love Slay the Spire. My current strategy is just going to be to stream Slay the Spire and I'm going to start saying out loud what's happening because I didn't want my channel to be a place for negativity and bashing other people and stuff. Um, and it still isn't going to be, by the way. You're not going to say negative things about Adrian and my channel. That's not what we're going to do. If you leave comments insulting him on this video, I will delete them. Um, that's not... That's not it. That's not the solution. Um, but yeah, I, I'm just going to play Slay the Spire now and I'm going to stop trying to be overly polite and avoiding saying that this guy is being an extremely malicious manipulator toward me and that I just don't think that you should trust him as a role model or content creator and that supporting him in the community is making the community worse. And insofar as you are responsible for how your view of reality and interactions with reality change the world, uh, if one of the things you do is support someone who says this about other people, I don't think that that's a great way to go about it. That all said, chapter five, resist. Um, this video isn't just about me. Uh, hopefully it didn't start out seeming like it was about me, and I know as we went through that, a lot of it was about me, but I really wanted to take you into the, like, how densely manipulative the world is and reality starts to seem when somebody who is a competent manipulator decides to lie about you and attack you. I wanted to bring you into that, and now maybe imagine that instead of that happening like one time and we analyzed it that one time that that is happening all the time for you constantly and that the people that you interact with day to day have heard things like that about you and that's how your achievements are framed and it gets to the point where you are being harassed and insulted and doxxed and like it really is not great um and there are large reasons why I think that we should stand up to this, and not just because it's affected me, but also because I know 
a, a significant number of other people, way too many in my opinion, who have had experiences like this with other strategy gamers, um, which have been similarly negative. Chapter five though is resist, because this is also a video for you. Having someone extend a false reality onto you is awful, 100%. If you're going through that the first time and it's happening to you and you're not sure what's going on and you think maybe that this person loves you and that you can go along with it and they're worth it because the good times outnumber the bad or something like that, you might start to feel guilty or self-conscious about the fact that you even feel bad. You might think, no, I shouldn't feel bad. It's not that big a deal. No, it is awful. It's really bad. It's shitty to feel like you will be interpreted in the worst way possible at all times by someone while they are treated with kindness. It's shitty to be asked for evidence that someone has treated you poorly, especially when they continually do so in front of people. It's shitty to see friends and acquaintances of yours express that they like that person or don't see anything wrong with that person's behavior and feel like speaking up about the manipulation betrays your friend's enjoyment of them as a person. I think a chunk of the time that you are in abusive relationships you love that other person and you don't want to tell their mother or whatever they are abusing me <laughs> um you don't want to tell your friends who have come to really like that person oh i introduced you to a real shitter actually um that's really hard this is a snippet of what interacting with the slow the spire community was like at the end of 2022, right before I dropped down to under 500 hours of Spire streamed in 2023. I said in December 2nd of 2022, Adrian was claiming, because now all of a sudden he did care about win streaks. He, he started off saying that all he cared about was win rates, but then he started caring about win streaks. And I am not going to try to work out why exactly uh, that just seems so exhausting, especially after watching this video. But now he um, goes for uh, win streaks on his channel, and that's like in his title, going for 50-0 watcher win streak, going for 20-0 rotating win streak. Um, I just don't have the energy at this point to really comment on that and how insulting that is and how, like, it's kind of pathetic that people in the Slay the Spire community are okay with that and support it to me. Like, it lowers my opinion of uh, people who watch Slay the Spire a little bit, and that's really tragic. And I generally love this community, and I have met some of the coolest people I have ever met through the Slay the Spire community. But how how have we let somebody who is so openly manipulating the people around him in the community just walk all over the community like that yikes um that's just hard um but anyway okay um so in december 2nd of 2022 uh adrian claimed that he had set a new watcher world record but there was an irregularity with it. He was counting the end of a set of watcher runs that he played in 2020. And then he had played watcher runs in between them in a couple of different ways. One of which was that volume challenge where he tried to do a bigger volume challenge than me, for example. Another one was he played some practice watcher runs. He, uh, I believe, played those on Ascension 19, so he didn't think they should count. But he, regardless, had Ascension 20 Watcher runs between 2020 and 2022 uh, in that volume challenge that he played, and he was just saying that those didn't count. And after going 18-0 at the end of his set in 2020, he went 24-0 at the beginning of this set of runs in 2022 and said that that meant that he had a world record streak of 42-0, which just didn't. So I think I mentioned this earlier when I was talking about how he wasn't consistent with what it actually meant to compete on win rate. Uh, he's also just not very consistent about win streaks. Like nobody else in the community thinks that that is going 42 and 0. There are a bunch of losses in the middle. Um, but he's so powerfully manipulative and 
so like convincing to his audience that somehow the conversation about it included a bunch of people like pretty convincingly or convincedly um seeming like they were convinced that it actually should count as a win streak um which speaks to his cult of personality or something like that i don't really know but it was just wild to me that that was a conversation um i had had one experience previously with another creator saying that they had a win streak and it turned out that they had been reloading fights where they didn't get an outcome that they wanted and also had lost her in the middle and just said it didn't count and they got just like laughed out of the community nobody was like oh it really was a win streak though like everyone was like no <laughs> are you kidding me do we not know what reality is but here when he said that he had a 42 and 0 like there was actually conversation about what reality was did he actually win 42 watch runs in a row no he didn't if you look in his watcher run history he hadn't won 42 in a row he had lost runs um in between but he claimed he had a 42 and 0 anyway so as somebody like removed from world record streaks a decent amount at that point um but who knew and had some amount of affection to some other people who did have world record streaks i kind of felt like i was in a pretty appropriate position to say hey that's not a world record streak um i also as somebody who has played many world record streaks before right i i have some amount of authority to comment on um how they have been played which is it's just kind of wild to me that this was like a thing that needed to be commented on and so i uh logged in to reddit to comment and the first thing i saw logging into reddit was that someone had dm'd me to tell me i deserved my abusive relationship uh because i get harassed on reddit uh because adrian makes content like the content that i just showed you um so I said, so the Spider Drama is incredible. Someone is claiming they have a 42 0 win streak after going 18 0 in 2020, playing in between with losses, and then going 24 0 in 2022. When I logged into Reddit to comment, I saw someone had DM'd me to tell me I deserved my abusive relationship. It's like all the drama that you get in any strategy game community, except the people who enjoy spending their time gossiping about drama only have about five different people total that they know have to talk shit about. I have weighed in that I do not think not winning 42 runs in a row is winning 42 runs in a row. And someone has told me everyone in the community hates me and then spent an hour doxing me as much as is easily possible. Another enjoyable foray into the community forum. This is just like what interacting with the Slay the Spire community in like the public forums of the Slay the Spire community is like for me now. After three years of Adrian saying this sort of shit about me nonstop. I made like what i consider to be an extremely reasonable and if anything like conservative post about what win streaks should be um i'm going to actually bring it up for you real quick on reddit if I can find it and like just show you real quick. It's called My Requirements for World Record Win Streaks. And what I said was mandatory win streaks must be of consecutive streamed runs on a character or rotating through the characters. Pods of the runs must be available and leave forever, but at the very least, at the time of claiming the record. That's what record means, that there is a record of it. Win streaks must be played without clear abuse of save load, mods, or glitches in the game. So those are my three mandatory things for win streak. I also had some things that I recommended for win streaks. I think win streaks should be played on the same major balance patch, which is mostly irrelevant for this point of the game. But historical behavior was like if you had a big 1.x win streak and then 2.0 came out on the beta branch. In my experience, people kept playing on 1.x until the end of their win streak before switching over to 2.0, which is like, again, doesn't really matter anymore. There are no more patches, so who cares? I said win streaks should be played without outside assistance if you want to claim them as solely your own win streak. 
So receiving help from chat with people pointing out math errors, suggesting lines of memory, potion chance, etc. is not ideal if you want to claim a wood streak of soul your own. It is fine to play the game without sight assistance, but if you do so, you should credit it appropriately. And it's a bit weird to be claiming you've beaten other people's records if your chat is regularly helping you think through your runs. I don't think that that's unreasonable. I just don't think that that's unreasonable. I think it's, for what it's worth, and maybe I phrase this poorly, like, you could claim, like, me and my chat put together a win streak that beat another person's win record, right? Like, that seems fine. But, like, generally in competitive situations, you don't have outside assistance. I think that's kind of understood. Uh, also, it's only recommended, right? <laughs> so this isn't even under mandatory, right? Right, it's only recommended. Win streaks should represent consecutive runs, even including offline play or play on other difficulties. This kind of sucks, but it is also a large part of why they are impressive challenges. So I don't think you should be practicing 10 runs of a character offline or on Ascension 19 before continuing to play an Ascension 20 heart streak, for example. I think that that diminishes from the achievement. Sure, whatever. I also said, because there's absolutely no ability for the Slayswire community to prevent cheating, it is sort of mandatory that claiming win streaks is done in a charitable and non-competitive way. If we place real importance and worth on win streaks, there's nothing stopping a streamer from doing something like have a friend DM them all the relevant information about the seed they're playing to help them set a new one. Uh, it's essentially impossible to have real competitions that aspire unless the people involved are clearly charitable and fear fair to each other. I don't think that that's super unreasonable. Also, the context within which I'm saying this is like, there is someone like Adrian in the community. <laughs> if Adrian regularly warps reality, frames things about other people very negatively, harasses them, abuses them, uh, encourages his chat to continue to do so as well. It's going to be really hard to have any sort of competition in the Slay the Spire community because like, people are not going to want to play with them. Uh, I also said in most competitive environments, code of conduct exists, which are seen as more important than skill at the competition if a professional athlete could be fined or suspended from playing games or certain actions, even if they are very good at the sport they play, and this might cause them to fail to achieve things, even though they are better than other players. And that I think you should like try to abide by some reasonable code of conduct if you're trying to compete. I say the spire towards your other competitors. Again, this is somewhat deliberately. Um, I mean, okay. Here's the thing. I would not probably have felt it was necessary to put that in here um, if everybody were behaving in a way that already respected the code of conduct. It's only there because there are people who aren't doing that, right? And then I talked about my own views on how I personally look for achievements on the channel um, and noted some stuff. This is, again, me sharing my experience, telling me what happened, etc. Okay. Uh, I still get made fun of for that post. I got doxxed for making that post. Uh, I still get made fun of. Um, people still bring it up on Reddit if I ever talk about anything on Reddit. They're like, remember that post George made where he was completely unreasonable about the world records? And, oh, he says that you're not allowed to have outside assistance, so he thinks Baylor's world record doesn't count and stuff like that. Like, I have a three-hour-long video talking with Baylor about his world record. <laughs> oh, that just isn't true. In that video, Baylor expressed that he was a little bit concerned because there was a potion that he thought might only spawn from Mud the Spire, which he picked up without really thinking about it, which he thought some people might find invalidated the run, and I reassured him, Baylor, nobody's going to care about that. So, <laughs> so the reality, no, quite the opposite, but like, yeah. Um, it sucked. It sucked a lot to interact with the Slay the Spire community uh, in 2022, largely on account of what was going on here. Um, the world will stop making sense if you're being abused. So I depersonalized in late 2020 through early 2021. I didn't know what the word depersonalized meant uh, before this, and so I didn't know what happened to me until like a year or two later. Um, but I stopped making memories. I largely stopped thinking myself uh, to be a human being. I just went through my life. I drank a decent amount. Uh, and I, yeah. You know, it wasn't that I was unhappy or suicidal. It was more that I was just detached. And 
I'm not going to say this was only because somebody was, like, manipulating and harassing me. But it certainly didn't help. There was a pandemic, right? I'm not a multimillionaire, so I was stuck in a small apartment with my partner who had lost her job uh, going through a pandemic in the U.S. Uh, while all this was happening. And this guy was, like, abusing me and harassing me while people applauded him. Uh, so I wasn't exactly unhappy or suicidal. It was more that I was detached. My reality had included beliefs like that the Slay the Spire community was kind, that the world was interested in celebrating my accomplishments, and that my viewers were interested in humanizing me. And when those beliefs were challenged, it made it quite hard to engage for a while. So I just kind of didn't. You don't have to be perfect, though. One of the most effective ways to manipulate someone is to seize on something they find shameful or negative about themselves, and then frame it as a bigger and bigger deal while minimizing the things they take joy in about themselves. But it's okay to not be perfect. Nobody is perfect. We are human. If someone insists on seeing all of the worst parts of you and none of the best parts of you, that doesn't mean you are bad. It means they are. And your friends and family, the people who love you, understand that you aren't perfect and love you despite that. While a manipulator may make you doubt yourself by disparaging you, the job of the people you love is to stand up for you despite your imperfections. And so it can be really, really, really hard. But if you find that you're being abused, it is important to be open with the people around you and ask for help and tell them what you're experiencing. And people will come for, through for you more than you might expect. Um, I found it really hard to ask for help for a lot of my life, and I set it as a goal in like 2019 to get better at asking for help. And oh my God, it is like a cheat code for life. Asking for help is so powerful, and there are so many people who are so willing to help you out if you have a reasonable request for them. Like, just like state how they could help you with 30 minutes of your of their time because of their skill set. And if they're a friend of yours and you're like, I really could use help. I need to work out how to fit some furniture into this room. I know that you're really good with spatial reasoning and have some interior design uh, experience. I was wondering if I could have you over, I'll feed you and give you a beer and you could talk through this with me. Like, like, <laughs> what do we exist for as human beings if not to say yes to a request like that? Um, it just, if you ask people for help when they can help you, people are generally going to want to help. And you're not perfect, but that is okay. Nobody is expecting you to be. And we are ready for you to come back. So I stopped charity work in 2021, partially due to bad interactions with a charity middleman, but also because I found I had no more positive energy to give to the Spire community. I was not finding that it was a positive place where I wanted to, um, you know, my charity events were largely about showcasing Slay the Spire and all of the cool things that you could do in it to people who were interested in positive change in the world. And I increasingly thought like, gee, I'm not sure this is a community that I want to show to people who are interested in positive change in the world. Um, and, you know, yeah, <laughs> that is what it is. Um, I am excited to play lots of Slay the Spire this year. I, I'm excited to be me and be me playing Slay the Spire, and I'm largely not interested in interacting with the Slay the Spire community at this point because of the contents of this video and the general lack of support I have received from other people in the community. Like there are some people I like a lot and I will collaborate with them, but in terms of like a community event, like no, I have no interest. Um, um, so yeah. I took a year or so of reducing my engagement with Spire. I played a lot of other games. I rediscovered my love of gaming and I rebuilt my own reality. That's like largely what I did stepping away from Spire. I was like, wait a second, no, I really like games. And then once I had that perspective of like, oh yeah, games are awesome, these are great. I like would play Spire again and I'd be like, oh, wait, Slay the Spire is really good. I understand why, why I love this game to begin with. Slay the Spire is, it is definitely my favorite game that you can play for more than 100 hours, 100%. There might be some short form games that are like six hour playthroughs, which I would put above it on a list in terms of like what I would recommend to people. In terms of a game that has a lot of replayability, Slay the Spire is easily my favorite game in the world. So at the end of 2023, I decided I would try to come back to play more Spire in 2024. I missed Spire. 
I love the game so much. And organize a charity event for the final week of 2023 to kickstart coming back. I thought I might get a few guests on it um, too. So I sent out some messages to people. Uh, the goal was just like anybody who had brought some positivity to my 2023. I wanted to reach out and invite to come share their experience of 2023 and chat about life and raise some money for charity. And I got a 90 plus percent response rate for an event that I was not paying people for, which is obscene. Um, it is hard to do that in content creation as like an indie strategy game streamer. I ended up booking the vast majority of 60 hours with awesome people who wanted to talk to me. And it was great. Uh, like, the world is here for you. It actually is kind um, that there is one person being extremely manipulative and cruel to you doesn't mean that everybody else is too. So, thanks for listening to my story, some of it at least, and for listening to my presentation. Be strong for yourself and for the people around you, and stop giving people so much benefit of the doubt. Give them some, but if manipulators tell you directly that they are manipulative, uh, when people tell you who they are, listen to them. Those are my thoughts. If you would like to read more about depersonalizing and reconstructing my identity as a streamer and stuff like that, I wrote a book called Before We Go Live, Navigating the Abusive World of Online Entertainment, which a lot of people have enjoyed. It sold, I think, two and a half thousand copies or so. And I have received so many comments from so many people saying like, hey, this was a really fun book. It's really well written and spoke to me in really meaningful ways. So if you like the presentation and would like some more of this sort of stuff, I recommend check out my book. Thanks for watching. See you next time.